Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Welcome to PyCon. How many of you, it's your first PyCon this year? Oh, wow, this is amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause. This is really good. Um, oh, come on. That was your round of applause? Come on, give yourself a round of applause. Thank you for coming to PyCon. It's a wonderful, wonderful community out here. Um, thank you also for coming to Network Analysis. I'm thrilled to share some knowledge that I've gained over the years with you about network science and network theory. Um, Riddle, where are you? There he is. Riddle is my TA. He's at the back of the room. He just did that. Um, if there are any questions throughout this tutorial, you can, there's a number of ways you can do it. You're, uh, one, feel free to interrupt the class and raise your hand, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions on the spot. Two, if you don't want to interrupt the class, you can always look back, look for Riddle, and wave to him. He'll come to you. Um, and three, if there's any other issues that, and, and, uh, that, that show up uh, and you want to be a bit more discreet, um, let's see if there's a, there's a nice way to improvise this. Maybe you can like, take a sheet of paper and like, fold it in some weird structure, and Riddle will, will be looking around for weird folded paper structures on your desk. You can do a crumpled ball if you wanted. Um, uh, but really, I'd, uh, because this is a class on network analysis, uh, I'd also have, I also have an emphasis on you should all be networking with one another. All right, this is a network analysis tutorial. Uh, part of my goal as an instructor is to show you how to model networks inside on your computer, but also how to build edges between people, right? So you should be talking with one another throughout this tutorial. Many a time I will be saying, this room should be noisy, right? And at that point, you should probably be talking with your neighbors about some of the coding problems that we have inside here. Okay. Quick sanity check before we go on. How many of you are going to have to use Binder? Please raise your hand. No problem. I affirm that this is the right thing to do because you are not supposed to be worrying about DevOps at this point. You should be worrying about how do I learn about network science, all right? The main point of this tutorial is network science. It is not how to install Conda or not how to get Conda environments working. Great. Okay, um, for those who are on Binder, uh, sometimes, a little heads up, sometimes Binder will fail to load on the first run. Don't worry, refresh your browser page, usually on the second or the third time, it works out fine. Also, for those of you who are on Binder, one thing to note, never leave your notebook running idle for more than, I think it's 10 minutes, right? If, you, if that happens, Binder is running on a public service, it's like AWS or something, they have automatic timeouts that are uh, implemented, so your kernel will get killed if you uh, leave your notebook running for more than 10 minutes, which means you'll have lost all of the work that you've done before, and you might have to run all cells before that notebook, before whatever cell that you left off on, okay? Um, if you leave it running for more than, I think, half an hour or something like that, some extended period of time, your entire binder image gets taken down. So uh, I will promise you I will not have any breaks more than 10 minutes, right? So <laughs> none of you who are running Binder will have your kernels shut down <laughs> or your instance shut down, <laughs> okay? And if that happens, you know what to, where to go. Go to, if that, in the event that actually does happen, just go back to that URL, uh, find the My Binder link, click on that, reload, you'll get up to speed, okay? Cool stuff? Great, so um, before we start, I wanted to uh, do a little pop quiz for everybody, all right? So this is a workshop on network analysis, but it's also on Python. I'm assuming some level of Python knowledge. We all have to start somewhere. Um, and so this is sort of a quiz that will help you to get up to speed on where I'm thinking uh, you have to be. So take a look at this quiz here. We have a list comprehension. How, how many of you know what list comprehensions are? Very good, very good. Um, in this list comprehension, which we have S4S in my favorite things, if S select name uh, boolean equals raindrops on roses, all right, so we have this list comprehension. Um, first things first, we're using this list comprehension to do what kind of an operation? So if I gave you a buildup where we're constructing a list, if I gave you filter, where we're filtering items from a list, and if I gave you a third option, which is uh, deleting a list, deleting items from a list, uh, which, ones are we do which one are we doing? Pardon me? Filtering. filtering, exactly. You can also, in an abstract sense, think of it as like we're deleting items from the original list and creating a new one, but that technically is just filtering. So filtering is the most technically accurate thing that we're doing here. So good. 
Second thing, uh, what's a plausible data structure for my favorite things? And what's a plausible data structure for s, the loop variable? Any, any, any answers, any takers? Yep, yep, absolutely. So there's nothing, there's, this is not a trick question. All right, this is not a trick question. Absolutely right. So my favorite things has to be a container of some sort. Uh, a list is possible. I can have a list of dictionaries, or I can have a tuple of dictionaries, right? A tuple of dictionaries is perfectly fine as well. Um, I believe my fave things, if it's a dictionary, you'll be iterating over keys. So this should not be the thing that you be, this should not work as a dictionary because you cannot, your keys cannot, must be hashable and therefore not mut mutable. Therefore, you can't have S, S is a dictionary. If S is a dictionary, you can't have uh, a, a mutable dictionary as your key, all right? Um, so then, what other alternative data structure could S take on? Set. Is set, no, no, okay, no worries. That, that's a good, good guess. Yes, a name tuple is the other, name tuple is the other plausible data structure, right? So a data, uh, a name tuple is one of the things that was added, I forgot which version of three it was added in, but it, it allows you to create these fixed length data objects, right, that let you uh, store data with, in a dictionary-like fashion, right, and you can access things as well. All right, so um, nothing particularly uh, fancy about that programming problem. Do note, list comprehensions will come up in a lot of places in this tutorial, so make sure you're, uh, at, the very, at the very minimum, by the end of this tutorial, you will be very intimately acquainted with list comprehensions, okay? All right, let's get into the main topic. Let's talk about networks. Ah, yes, Riddle. Can I zoom in? If I zoom in anymore, that's what happens. Is this acceptable to people? Let me see, can I toggle the header and toggle the toolbar? Doesn't really help things. Um, does it? Does it sort of help things? You can use the full screen. Use Chrome full screen. Still help things? All good? Everybody okay? All right, great. Good, so let's talk about graphs. Um, we commonly talk about networks and graphs as being sort of interchangeable terms for the same thing. What we're using networks for is to model relationships between entities. So uh, I want to do a, another little uh, questionnaire, poll everybody. What kind of networks have you seen in the real world before? Any takers? Sorry, raise your hand so I can see where. Back there. Road networks. Okay, so when we talk about road networks, what are the entities between which we're modeling what kind of relationship? Okay, so there are points on the ground and roads form the edges, the, the connections between them. Okay, what else do we have? Another one back there? Intersections. Okay, can you explain a little bit? Where two roads meet, okay, there's a dot there, and then we model connectivity between intersections. Okay, so it's, again, a road network as well. Uh, in the front? Okay, uh, we're looking for concrete examples. Can you think of one? Okay, all right. Sorry, pardon me? Spotify. So what, uh, what kind of networks show up in Spotify? Okay, so people who follow other people, right? So that's another kind of network. Any others? Movies and actors. Movies and actors. Uh, what... So what are the entities? Uh, well, the actors, actors and nodes are nodes. Movies no movies can be nodes. And the participation of an actor in a movie can be a node. Okay, awesome. So a uh, lead actor is an edge. Uh, you know, side role is also an edge. Okay. Uh, anyone else from this side of the room? Yep, up front. Uh, Routers and switches. So what would be the what would be the nodes and what would be the edges? internet connection, right? How many of you, when you first touched down in, your, in Cleveland in your hotel, the first order of business was get me on Wi-Fi? Yes, yeah, same here. Okay, great, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're all millennials at this point. Um, back in the room, back there. 
Electrical grid, okay. Uh, well, this, this will be the final concrete example. So what, what about an electrical grid is the node and what about the electrical grid is the edges? Yep, and, and then the power lines between them constitute the edges. Okay, so great. So when we talk about networks, uh, we often talk about them in terms of, uh, or, or graphs. There, there are two things that you need to remember. Graphs are an, uh, an object of some kind that are comprised of two kinds of entities. There are nodes, which are the actual things inside that you're modeling relationships between, and edges, which are the relationships that you're, are being modeled. All right? So um, it is very important that when we define a graph, we define both what the entities are and what type of relationships occur between them. All right? So uh, when we draw graphs, typically you'll see them as circles with lines between them or like shapes with lines between them, and that's the, that's the most common way of visualizing these things. Okay, so when I was in grad school, I uh, attended a seminar at the Harvard School of Public Health, and it was by a professor, John Quackenbush, who was speaking on some network science and inference used in biological problems. I'm actually quite surprised nobody brought up a biological network at this at this session, because that's a, that's a common one that people have also showed up, um, uh, have, have offered. Um, it was about, I think, protein-protein interaction networks in which the nodes are proteins and the edges are the fact that two proteins have some biochemical interaction as defined by some biochemical assay. And when he gave this talk, he, gave me a, he, he had a quote which has stuck with me ever since. It's that the heart of a graph lies in its edges, not in its nodes. It's the way that things are connected inside a graph that makes a graph data structure special. It's not the nodes. But humans are attuned to thinking about the nodes. We're always attuned to thinking about the nodes. So um, if you think about it, when you have a data analysis problem, typically you have samples from a population, right? People, people uh, that you're measuring, say, some outcome in patients for which you're measuring some outcome in, in the real world. Um, we tend to think about them as like independent samples, uh, but what's really interesting is not the nodes themselves, but rather how the nodes are connected that gives rise to some more interesting stuff on the graph. So we'll get to that, right? We'll get to that in, in the following notebooks and exercises, but I want you to keep this in mind, that the heart of the graph, what makes a graph special is how, they're con how the nodes are connected rather than the node identities and their properties themselves. Okay, so keep this in mind as we go along. So finally, I want to talk about graph types. Uh, in the examples that you all raised just now, uh, there are a variety of different graph types. In NetworkX, which is the package software package that we'll be using to uh, learn about network science, there are four graph types implemented. There are regular undirected graphs, uh, nx.graph objects. Then there are directed graph objects. Then there are multi-undirected graph objects, and finally, multi-directed graph objects. And so the, but the basic distinction that I want you to keep in mind, the more important one, is the distinction between an undirected graph and a directed graph, all right? In the examples that you raised, which ones are undirected graphs and which ones are directed graphs? So for those of you who answered, would you like to try to hazard a guess? Anybody? So back there. Okay, so road networks are an interesting one in which we have, typically you don't have a one-way path to nowhere. But sometimes you do. All right, so sometimes some roads are a one-way path from one place, one dot to another. Uh, but if we're talking about, say, the, the trans-city, you know, transcontinental type of road networks, they're typically bidirectional. So we would call this, what, a directed graph or undirected graph? You'd call it a directed graph with explicit bidirectional edges, okay? Um, what else? What about the power grid? How would you think of the power grid? Okay, okay, very good, very good. How we're defining the directionality is important uh, on the power grid back there. Well, we also have uh, meter readers coming off that. Okay. So, 
Okay, so that's another layer of uh, another layer of information that's flowing on the grid. You probably could model it that way, exactly. So we're getting pretty pretty complex here already. Okay, so in this case, then what would you uh, what would you call it? You would call it a uh, an undirected graph, or you would you call it a, a directed bidirectional graph? Probably depending on what we're modeling, right? depending on what we're trying to model on that graph. Okay, what about um, social networks? So let's take LinkedIn, for example. What is LinkedIn? Is LinkedIn a directed or undirected graph? Why is it undirected? That is the right word for it, actually. Yeah, very good. Um, uh, the relationship is automagically uh, symmetric. Uh, automatically is what I've decided to add on top. It is automatically uh, symmetric in that once I connect with someone, that person automatically connects with me, and bidirectional flow of information is possible, but we don't have, we don't have a need to model it as a bidirectional edge in terms of the, the connection graph, right? We can just say, you're connected to you, you're connected to you, everybody's connected to everybody, right? That, that's the sort of thing. Okay, what about Twitter? Pardon me? Directional, why? Yes, so you can follow someone. If we're defining the edge as I follow you, then I can follow someone and that person doesn't have to follow me back. Right? So Twitter would be a directed graph. So um, we very quickly touched on some complex situations where the data model, whether you use an undirected graph or a bidirectional, explicit bidirectional kind of a graph, uh, that choice is really dependent on the type of problem you're trying to model. So it's, it's very context specific. So I won't say which one is at exactly always the right choice to make, but you have to think about what problem you're trying to solve there. All right, so yes, we have the, the directed and undirected graphs. We already did some examples of networks. Um, I guess, all right, so now that we're done with sort of this like basics sort of thing, uh, uh, I'll just very quickly show you, tell you what I want you to take away from this tutorial, and then we'll move on to the notebooks, okay? So from this tutorial, my hope is you'll learn the NetworkX API, you'll have fun learning about network science and the kinds of problems we can solve with network science. Keep in mind, this is a tutorial in which I'm not going to be up here blabbering for 30 minutes on end, right? Because I don't want your binder connections to be lost. Um, uh, this is a tutorial in which you, the participant are expected to actively be coding on your computer and solving hard problems and talking with one another, building edges between people, all right? So that's something that's explicit that, that I want. Uh, you should be able to use NetworkX. You should be able to visualize, uh, have, a, have some tooling to visualize uh, graphs um, in, as matrices, as, as circles plots, as, uh, or, or the vanilla drawing tools that are available in NetworkX. Uh, I want you to be able to uh, be able to think on graphs. Think on graphs, and by that I mean writing algorithms that operate on graph data structures, like uh, pathfinding algorithms or structure finding algorithms, all right? And finally, um, if you're here for part one and part two, we'll definitely get into it, unlike previous years. We'll definitely get into like network statistical inference. We'll get into the bonus material that's on the notebooks. Typically in previous iterations, uh, if you're only here for part one, uh, which was what, I, what was offered before. Uh, we could only get up to bipartite graphs and I'd have to just do this half an hour lecture at, right at the end. Um, this year, if you're here for both tutorials, you'll get the full thing, the full, full experience with uh, network analysis from us. And finally, what I, on a broader perspective, uh, what I'm hoping that you'll be able to do is to not only think about the nodes on your graph, but also how the edges affect how you think about the nodes on the graph, all right? How to, to, to keep in mind that there's relationships between entities and not, or interactions between entities and not just the entities themselves. We don't just have our patient samples, we have relationships between patients that could confound our analysis and we, could, we wanna see how these relationships might inform how we do our analyses, for example. Also, this year, because of the extended, extended format, um, my hope is you'll be able to think through, you know, more uh, advanced statistical and numerical forms 
of looking at graphs rather than just objects. And I'm hoping to convince you that being able to use NumPy is actually a great thing for doing network science as well, OK? Do we have any questions at this point? Any questions about the format? Any questions about uh, uh, f foundational things at this point? Nope? OK. So with that, I would like to invite you to open up notebook number two. Notebook number two, uh, the student version, obviously, for you guys, and the instructor version for me. Though I will say, if you do get stuck in any of the exercises, there's a reason why the instructor notebook is available to you in the exact same repository. You, uh, it is not cheating for you to open up the notebook and find the clue that you need to get unstuck from the problem. However, I will preface it, it's going to be much more fun and much more educational if you talk with your neighbor and if you pair code. And if you make that bond, make an edge between people, all right? So go talk with your neighbors. Every time I say this room should be noisy, you should be talking with your neighbors and, and trying to solve these problems, OK? Cool. Um, let's see. So let's get started. Notebook 2 is all about getting into the fundamentals of the NetworkX API, all right? The NetworkX API. And you need to know how to use the NetworkX API and how to read the documentation for the NetworkX Network API in order to get the full benefit from this. So what we're going to do is, for this notebook, as with every other notebook, we're going to play with one or two uh, focal point data sets that will help anchor our discussion of whatever concepts and ideas that we have here. Uh, and do a few analyses on it. So let's. So how many, everybody has a notebook to open. Okay, great. Um, so this notebook is all about the Network X API. Uh, what I want you to know from this, the take home is that Network X graphs are just dictionaries of dictionaries of dictionaries. It's dictionaries all the way down. Okay, it's dictionaries of dictionaries of dictionaries, um, and. Therefore, getting familiar with accessing elements in a dictionary is very important, all right? So that's, that's the big thing. What, the data set that we're going to use for this notebook is a cute one, all right? It's a bunch of seventh grade students from a school, I think it's in Victoria. I don't know if it's my hometown, Victoria, British Columbia, or if it's Victoria, Australia. Um, we'll see which one it is. Um, but basically, there are 29 seventh grade students from a school. Uh, and they were just asked in a poll, who's your best friend? Right? That's it. Who's your best friend? That's all it was. Um, uh, it's basically who's your preferred classmate for three different activities. All right? So a node represents a student. An edge, represents the, uh, an edge between the two nodes shows that the left student picked the right student as their answer for each of those activities. There are edge weights between one and three, and they show how often the left student chose the right student. We don't know for which activities exactly, but we do know for how many times, how many times they, they chose. So right off the bat, what is the definition of this graph? Who are the nodes and who are the edges? The nodes are students. The edges are I pick you, right? Like I pick you, I pick you, I pick you, I pick everybody. We're not doing Oprah at this point. Um, uh, so, and, and is this a directed or undirected graph? The reason it's directed is because I pick you and you don't necessarily have to pick me, right? Okay, great. So, can you run this cell? Uh, there's a few loading, lo data loading functions that I've implemented in this custom funks uh, directory, custom funks module. Run this cell so that you have the graph in memory as the object G. All right, so this is a convention that NetworkX uses. We use a capital letter G to represent a graph. You can, do, you can name them in different ways. Uh, in Riddle's notebooks later on, we'll show you how to do that. All right, so first off, uh, whenever we start a graph analysis of any kind, we want to know what nodes, how many nodes and what nodes are present, how many edges and what edges are present. So let's, let's take a look at this. To get the number of nodes, sorry, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. To get who are the nodes, you want to do something like G. Every graph G uh, has a class method called dot nodes that you can run, and it will give you a list of 
a, a node, a view on the nodes that are present inside the graph, all right? So if you do g.nodes in, in that notebook cell, you'll get back a view on the nodes that are present. So what is this? Um, we've identified each student by an integer, one, two, three, four, five. Integers are allowed to be your nodes. Strings can be your nodes. Um, tuples can be your nodes. Anything that's uh, hashable, that is non-mutable, you can, they can be your nodes. Very typically what we do is uh, a modeling choice that I've, I've often stuck to is I've used integers for the nodes and then I, stuck, I stick on extra metadata, as you'll see later on, onto the nodes that help me uniquely identify what exactly that node is, okay? Now, due to changes in the NetworkX API, uh, you can't even, so this node view thing, you can't slice it and get a particular, a particular node, it will throw you an error, right? So if you try to do g.nodes and then you use the square brackets, try to select the first element zero, that will throw you an error. Instead, what you have to do is you do have to first cast it as a list, right? So a list of g.nodes uh, will give you uh, a list that you can then, it will convert that nodes view thing into a list that you can then select from, okay? So that's, that's how we play with the NetworkX API, getting, getting to know which nodes are present. So list of g.nodes, and if I want to select just the first five, I just do this. So what I'd like you to do is attempt the first exercise then, which is to write a single line of code that returns the number of nodes in a graph, all right? And when, uh, I'll give a maximum of one minute for this exercise. If you're done, I'd like to see a thumbs up, and we'll move on at approximately 80% quorum, which actually within, what, eight seconds, everybody got to it. <laughs> so did you get the number 29? Okay, so for those of you who didn't get it, it's len of g.nodes. So g.nodes itself, even though it's a view, it does have a len property. So you can get the length of the, num length of the number of nodes. There is an alternative, which is to use len of g. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I, it's 31 because I ran the whole notebook and I've mutated the graph at the, w at the end. So there are two nodes added at the end. So if you do len of g right now, you should get 29, right, okay? Great. So now, the next thing that we need to know is who's connected to who, or and, and or how many edges are present in the network. So, if we want to get a list of all of the edges, again, we have, if you do g.edges, you will get an edges view, you have to cast it as a list, then you can figure out uh, uh, what elements are, what, what edges exist. So, with that, go to the next exercise, which is the number of relationships that are present, and when you're done, please give me a thumbs up. Okay. 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 Great. 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 Very good. 15 seconds. This is like amazing. Okay. Uh, people got 376. Great. All right. That's exactly how many edges are present. So, um, this is the main idea. Uh, a network is a graph that's comprised of a set of nodes, so that's why we have the dot nodes methods, and then we have the dot edges methods that gives us the, uh, the, the relationship list. Now, let's say we have metadata, right? These are seventh grade students. What kind of metadata can we add onto them? Their name, okay, their biological sex, what else? Their age, what else? Uh, seventh graders, yes, actually, that's right. Um, uh, related then, date of birth, etc. What about the relationship edges? We can also have metadata that exists on top of that. So what kind of metadata can we add? Whether it's two-way or not. Um, but on a directed graph, by definition, every edge is only one way. Right, so uh, but that's valid if... Uh, if we were to create an alternate representation of the graph. Um, I can't immediately think of how, but it, it is possible. Back there? The activity. the activity on which they said, I prefer you. Okay, what else? Okay, um, uh, let's say this, so assuming this poll was done over the course of an academic semester or an academic year, we can then ask, what, like, when was this, 
when did you finally decide I prefer you? Okay, anything else? Okay, so uh, uh, how many, or well, how many people like them? Is that a property of the edges or a property of the node? Why is it a property of the node? Intuitive, we all, intuitively, we get it. It's a property of the node because it's something that, uh, it's a property of the node. Okay, so it, the correct way to put it is it's a property of the node that comes from the edges. And we'll get to, we'll get to that in a moment uh, in the next notebook. So what else? Okay, so uh, let's, let's stop it there. Um, so in NetworkX, what, the way that we use, the way that we uh, store metadata is to do these attributes and it's stored as a dictionary, right? So you can think of it as if I had um, key value pairs on each node that says, say for students, every student gets a key called name and then their, their name is recorded on as the value. Um, their date of birth is a key and uh, the value is their actual birth date, right? So we can do that. Now this is a social network of people. So what we'll do is we'll get the, uh, if we want to get the metadata of these students, right? In this case, I've only encoded one thing, which is their, their gender. Um, if we want to encode the, their attributes on this graph and get it back, sorry, then what we do is we pass in g.nodes and we pass in the keyword data equals true. And that gives us, what is this data structure that's returned? It's a list of, of what tuples? What tuples, how many? Two tuples, right? The tuples can be k tuples, right? And this is a two tuple because it's got two elements, in which the first element is the node, and the second element is a dictionary. Exactly, right? So we're, let's just let's be very precise here. That is the data structure that we get back when we iterate over uh, g dot nodes data equals true, right? So what I'd like you to do is to count how many t uh, male and female students are represented inside this data set. Right? Knowing what you know about Python, do some form of looping to figure out, uh, to count how many students are male and how many students are female. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. This room should be noisy. <laughs> Great, I see a connection being made there. Very good. All good? You need, oh. How many of you remember the? Binder, use binder. There's a link. Is there a local link? Uh, All right, where are we at? How many people are done? Thumbs up, please. 
All right, we're, we're about 70% quorum, so we'll give it to the full three minutes. Okay, all right, so um, you should have counted that there are 12 male students and 17 female students inside there. If you look at the instructor notebook or the answer that I'm flashing up there, you'll notice I've used a list comprehension, right? Uh, I was actually TAing Trey Hunter's list comprehension or you know, looping tutorial, loopy tutorial, no, not loopy tutorial, looping tutorial yesterday, yesterday afternoon and uh, learned a lot about, you know, um, using the, the art and science of using list comprehensions. Highly recommended that. If you didn't go for it yesterday, catch the YouTube version. It probably is already up, thanks to the awesome AV team at the back. Um, so uh, we use a list comprehension to select out just the information that we want. So we want the, the gender of the students. You'll notice we can, because uh, g.nodes returns a tuple, we can do the tuple unpacking, n, d in g.nodes, data equals true. Right? We can do that in the, loop, uh, in the loop statement. And then D becomes the dictionary on which we can then grab out all of the metadata, select the metadata that we want, and then we pass that list of stuff into the counter object, it automatically does the counting for us. Right? So everybody okay with this? Any questions on this guy? Great. So let's talk about the edges data equals true. What's this data structure? Similar to the nodes, it is a list of three tuples. The first element and the second element are nodes, and the third element is a dictionary. Great. So you know this. So let's try to solve the next exercise, right? So which is the maximum number of times. Let's confirm that the data are correct, that the maximum number of times that any student rated another student is three, all right? That's the maximum, and some people are just besties. You just can't pull them apart. And this room should be noisy. Okay, how many people are done? Thumbs up, please. We're about 70% quorum, so we'll just wait up to the two-minute mark, which is closing in on us. Okay, so I think people got the programming pattern. Again, it's a list comprehension inside here. So we get the counts of how many students, how many times each student rated another student, 
and we're just verifying that the max is three, which is what we expect, and indeed there are some students who are besties, all right? Cool, um, so now there's another thing that's really important. You might be given some graph data. You might also need to modify that graph data by adding nodes um, because there were some missing data, right? So this is a little bit about the Network X API. Um, we found out that there are two individuals uh, that were left out of the network, individual number 31 and 30. They're one male, one female, and they just love hanging out with individual seven, right? So let's, uh, let's add this information to the graph, all right? And if you need some help, what I've given you is a starter piece. A middle, there's a question back there. Um, what I've given you is a starter piece of code that you can use inside the student notebooks, follow that programming pattern, and you'll be fine. And if you need more help, there should be a link to the docs. But the internet is slow, so let's not worry about that for the time being. Ah, yes. That's right. G dot node, uh, add node, question mark and that will show up. So you do the question mark and then shift tab. Okay, want to see how many people are done here? Okay, good. Question? That's right. That's a bug in that's a bug in the problem. Okay. It's intentional. Okay. Right? Don't worry about that. We'll we'll sweep that under the rug for the time being. Okay. And I, I've been aware of this question bug for a long time. And I'll, I'll repeat it for everybody later on. The reason is because this is a graph. This is a graph that is, so the question is, why do we need to include the reverse direction, right? Seven does like to hang out. They all love to hang out with one another. My bad if the wording is a little. Okay, pardon me? So the question is, is there a way to... Yes, um, we could do some fancy iter tools combination thing. It's not part of the API, that's right. Okay, how many people are done? Okay, we're about 50%. For those of you who are already done and feel the urge to move on to the further exercises down below, feel free to do so. Um, I won't be offended. It's totally normal. It's totally okay. I do not want you to be stopped by whatever we're doing here. And for those of you who are feeling a little stuck, I have the answer flashed up on the screen as I always will be doing for the instructor notebooks. Ah, 
Okay, so in terms of the scale, we usually want, I'm gonna talk about that later, but generally, generally, generally the idea is if your graph node data and edge data can fit in memory, then you can do this graph in memory. And if you can't do it, if you can't hold both of these together in memory, then you shouldn't. So scale is usually up to a hundred thousands of nodes. Um, you'll see later on that with the real data set in the matrices notebook, uh, you can get really efficient certain operations. You can be calculate really efficiently with matrices in sub-second times, whereas with you did if you did the graph objects, it'd take 20 seconds at, at one shot. Okay? The assert is telling me that the diagraph doesn't have an ob or an attribute edge. Did I... Oh, my bad. Uh, it should be dot edges. Edges. Cool. My bad. That's okay. Thank you. I forgot to update that no the notebook for that. Okay, all right, no problem. For those of you who have hit the, uh, for those of you who have hit the uh, assertion, the test graph integrity, uh, minor detail, thank you for those of you who've pointed it out. Um, G dot edges, not G dot edge, is what you need to access. So please change all of the G dot edge to G dot edges. And, uh, I will make sure I have this updated and reflected correctly after the tutorial. All right, so just make sure that your assertion statements are reflected over here. All right, but if you got, if you got the code above, which is a bunch of add node and add edge statements, you're probably correct, and I won't be, you know, I don't want to dwell too much on this. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. It's more interesting if errors like this pop up. Okay, cool. No problem. Um, it does reflect the change in the Network X API from 1.x to 2.x, all right? In the past, you would do, it literally was dictionary, 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 so you just do selector, selector, selector. Now, in this case, it's a different kind of syntax. You do selector of A comma B to select a pair of nodes. Okay, so we're at the five minute mark, so I'm gonna move on from this. Um, few pointers to make. First off, if you look at the problem definition and how this graph was constructed, you'll notice there's a bug. How can, if, if, if node number seven already has chosen someone else a few times, how can they choose node number 30 and 31 another three times, right? So that's, that's a bug, that's an intentional bug, it comes from us not having defined the, the, the definition, not having the definition of how many times a student or how many students uh, each student can rate at one shot, right? Do I rate three people at one shot and give them one on the first activity? Then do I rate another three students or do I only rate one at a time, right? So we didn't make this clear at the beginning. So in this case, treat this as a bug that I'm sweeping under the rug for the time being. Uh, we're going to ignore it. The main point is the API and how you add nodes and add, add edges to the graph, okay? All right, so um, I have a, an exercise which I added after doing this workshop at ODSC. Um, you'll, well, we talk about unrequited friendships. Right? I, like, I prefer you, but you don't prefer me. <laughs> um, so this is a nice break time exercise that you can try to figure out. Um, try to figure out how many of such friendships are like that. Like, I prefer you, but you don't seem to prefer me, right? These sad students, uh, uh, this, which actually might be a great, so I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's a, a, a teacher who identified uh, emotionally struggling students by having them each, at the end of each week, pick out who they want to sit next to the next week, and she did the social network analysis to figure out which students were being isolated. Then she figured out these are the students that we need to pay more attention to, right? So this is a great, great application of social network analysis done in a really intelligent way, right? So I really like that. Um, okay, so we're going to move on. That is something that I, uh, when we're on the break time, which is coming up, uh, I'd, like you to, I'd like you to do. For the time being, I uh, just want to make a few points on tests and coding patterns. Right? I use the testing pattern from software development uh, and apply it to data analysis. We should be testing our data. 
If you do not test your data, bad things can happen. If you do not test the assumptions that you have of your data, bad things will happen. And if you do not write tests after bad things happen to your data, bad things will continue to happen. All right, so write tests for your data. Um, Software Carpentry has really good resources on defensive programming, um, things that we should do to check our assumptions about our data, go check it out. I also did a lightning talk on data testing uh, three years ago. Um, so it's, it was a fun thing, fun little thing with a minimal example that shows why you should be, uh, uh, how you should approach writing your tests. Also, another point to make here is that there's this thing about list comprehensions. So I'd recommend that you use the following kind of uh, programming pattern for compactness uh, in your code, right? So use list comprehensions rather than for loops, especially if you're constructing something that you're going to iterate from another list, right? So uh, it's a very useful pattern to have. Um, finally, uh, I want to make a few points on graph visualization before we move on, all right? So this is sort of like uh, take a break from the coding for a moment, listen tightly. First off, what do you see here? Yes, uh, thank you. For those of you who said a mess, um, <laughs> I see a hairball, all right? Have you ever read those uh, pop popular science or scholarly articles of physicists analyzing the scale of the web? And then they have like these big colorful hairballs? Yeah, that's exactly what they are. They are colorful hairballs. They're non-informative visualizations. Um, if your graph is small, you can use nx.draw. And the kind of rule of thumb that I have is 30 nodes-ish or less, fine. I'm not going to judge you for using nx.draw. It'll do its own thing. There are more informative layouts that are provided, right? So we can do the layout of the graph in different ways, uh, like a circular layout or a force-directed layout. Uh, still, though, if it's, if it's like 30-odd nodes, force-directed, uh, and, and the plain old circular layout is still it's pushing it, but once you get the big graphs, don't even try, right? Don't even try hairballs. You're not going to get anything informative from them. Instead, I want to recommend that you try something else. Um, oh, sorry. So yes, you can also draw with labels, right? Draw with labels if you, if you need. Again, if the network is small, go ahead, use the plain vanilla drawing, drawing uh, stuff in NetworkX. But if the networks are big, I'd recommend something else. So, um, ooh, do I have an error here? Very interesting. I know what's happening over here. Change kernel to NANs. And cell, restart, and run all. OK, so uh, if you look at your own notebooks, or if you look at the HTML versions of the notebooks, you'll see a matrix over there. One guy mentioned uh, he's seen graphs as adjacency matrices. This is exactly what is being shown in the adjacency matrix plot. So over here, right? If we have a graph that is unweighted, that is another thing that you might want to think about, whether you have an unweighted graph or a weighted graph. If we have an unweighted graph in which all we're saying is, if I have an edge, I say 1, and if there's no edge, it's a 0, then we can plot the 1s and zeros on this matrix which, in which we have nodes by nodes, all right? And uh, the, the cell corresponds to an edge between that pair of nodes. All right? That makes sense? Yep. Cool. So now, what is an interesting thing about this matrix that you can see from this, from this view? It's One, it's not symmetrical. And that is a property of uh, directed graphs. You are not guaranteed symmetry. So if you have something that is from node to to node, right, source to sync, source node, sync node, um, if, you, if, you have, if you don't have guaranteed bidirectional edges um, between pairs of nodes, then it won't be symmetrical. What else is interesting about this graph? Yes, that's right. We don't have narcissists in class, right? <laughs> we do not have narcissists. Narcissists are not good. Um, we do not want to raise a generation of narcissists. <laughs> so very good observation. Nobody says, I prefer myself for particular activities. I prefer to not to work. So very, it's a very good thing. So um, this actually brings us to a more important concept of how we define edges. Are we allowing self-loops or not? All right? If we are allowing self-loops, uh, then we, if we so, so in most graphs, it doesn't make sense to allow for self-loops. Right? How can you have 
uh, a student liking themselves, right? Uh, or in Facebook, I can't friend myself, right? That, that notion doesn't make sense. Can you think of an example where a self-loop actually does make sense? Pardon me? Okay, all right, so uh, you're saying a connection from localhost to localhost between maybe applications. I think that's, that's where we're going. So um, applications that run on computers. Computer is the node, but a, an edge is defined as an application calls something else on another node, right? And so sometimes what, there are two applications running, two separate applications that are running on the same node, and they're making calls to one another, right? So that, that could be one. Anything else? Travel graph, okay, how would that work? Um, like okay. Okay, so some people like, uh, like, like just sitting on the train from one station and coming back to the same place, right? Oh, yes, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a very valid one. In fact, I wrote my own email myself Python package um, that lets me send mail to myself from the command line. So useless things that we do with Python. <laughs> what else? <laughs> Pardon me? Voting. Voting. So a candidate votes for themselves. Yeah, that, that's actually a quite a natural, good, good natural example. Uh, we would not have, um, it would be weird if our political candidates voted for their opponent. Unless we said you had made a rule that you actually have to symbolically give one vote to the other, right? Okay. Um, Cool, so those are examples of where self-loops are, are an acceptable thing, right? So in most cases, this is a good way of quickly diagnosing do I have self-loops or not. There's another kind of plot, which is called the arc plot. The arc plot is the foundation of uh, what I, it's what I would call the foundation of the rational visualization world. So when we talk about rational visualization of graphs, what we're really saying is prioritize the placement of nodes over the placement of edges. And it sort of makes sense. We, we, we place the entities in places in a way that we can understand. So in this case, we'll order the students by their, group the students by their gender, right? And then maybe order them by their connectivity within each group, and then, and then draw, fi figure out the right way to draw the lines between them. And so in the arc plot, we basically just draw Bezier curves between the two, uh, between nodes. Another one is a circles plot. And a circles plot, we'll be drawing lots of these today. And it's just taking the ends of the arc plot and like sticking them together, right? That's all it is. So nothing fancy, no magic going on inside there. And finally, there's a hive plot. The hive plot is an interesting plot. What it does is, let me zoom out a little bit. What the hive plot does is it lets us visualize intra and inter connections, intergroup connections in a way that's sort of separate. So visually on the 2D plane, we can visualize the intra-group connections and the inter-group connections, right? And we can see some of the guys are really popular with the girls and so on, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so everybody all right with that? All good with that. Okay, let's see. It's 9.59 right now. Break is at 10.15. So I'm trying to figure out what the most rational thing to do here is. We could either take a 15-minute break Oh, sorry, no. If we take a 15-minute break, you won't get your coffee. Um, we can move on to, other, to the next notebook and just do the intro first. We can answer questions. Actually, do you have any questions? Gephi in the, in the Python world. No, I do not know of any. And I think Gephi is the only GUI-based uh, tool that I can think of for doing graph visualization. Riddle, do you have any examples? Yeah. Okay, all right. I have a different philosophy, but I'll take that. I'll dig that. Gephi is, uh, Riddle's answer is Gephi is the best. Don't use Python. <laughs> Back there. No, go ahead, go ahead. In places where I expect things to be brittle, then yes. So there's a bit of an, uh, an art judgment call inside there. So that's a good point on defensive programming. Any other questions so far? I did have one from the front, which was like, what kind of scale of graphs would you be using NetworkX for? And why am I using Network? Why are we using NetworkX here? 
So if you're going to billions of nodes and billions of edges, then do not use network X. Your, the RAM consumption is just gonna be way too high because of the dictionary-based dictionary based dictionary. Uh, data structure. My rule of thumb is if you can have an edge list with all your metadata and a node list with all your metadata and stick that in memory, then you probably can do the network X thing in memory as well. Uh, if you're going to that scale, billions and billions of nodes and edges, then I would recommend using a graph database of some kind to, to do your data modeling. Uh, if you're not at that scale, like that's overkill for most problems, right? Why are we using network X though? Network X is known to be not the fastest, not the most performant, not the most memory efficient, but we use Network X for teaching this tutorial because it's got the best API. It's got the most uh, education-friendly API. A lot of concepts uh, and basic things that you need to know, you can pick it up by looking at the Network X documentation. Uh, many other graph libraries have got, like iGraph, for example, they've got, or, or Zen, they've got C++ code underneath that makes it really fast, but they've done a not so good job of making the documentation and the API intuitive to use, all right? So that's why we use the Network X package for this tutorial. But I do want to make sure you know that there are options out there for doing like large graph analysis, like Neo4j is a graph database that is very popular, it's open source. I think there are unofficial Python bindings as well that let you write, you know, construct the graph and write queries on it. Any other questions? Okay, so, all right. Uh, here's what we'll do. I want to make sure you get to your coffee before every other tutorial gets to the coffee. So we will make sure that at 10.13, I will just do a hard stop. You will get two minutes ahead of the line to go to grab coffee and whatever snacks they have there. Uh, and then we'll, and wherever we are is wherever we'll cut, and then we'll just come back and continue, all right? So I'd like you to open up notebook number three. If you could open up notebook number three and take a look at this, run the first few cells inside the notebook. So what we have here is uh, a notebook in which we're gonna talk about sort of how do you think on graphs and how do you uh, look at important nodes that are inside a graph, right? So let's say we had a social network and let's take Twitter. I'm on Twitter too much these days. Thankfully, I don't follow Kanye West. Um, otherwise, his feed would just explode. His, his tweets would explode my feed. Um, let's think about Twitter. Uh, what would you consider to be an important person on Twitter? Kanye West. <laughs> By virtue of what, though? How are we measuring how important he is? Number of followers that he has, okay. Okay, so we can measure the number of times other people retweeted Kanye West's tweets, okay. Um, any, any other notions of an important person? Impressions, uh, still quite similar so far. How many times they're tagged on someone else's tweet? Okay, so that's another, that's another good measure that's slightly distinct, I think. Uh, what else is there? Verified or not, but this is a node property. This is not, a, this is not a, a graph theoretic property. Nonetheless, that is still correct on how we would measure importance of an individual. Though it is biased, right? Like there are, uh, Twitter, Twitter has its biases in the way that they um, approve the verified accounts, I think. Um, Yes, yes, that is another. Yeah, okay, so that is another type of importance. And we're gonna explore both the majority opinion, which is like how many times am I connected to someone else by some metric, and also how important am I in terms of like bridges, being a bridge between places, all right? Or a bridge between communities. So the latter is what we often don't think about, and we'll get to that. All right, for, but for the first part, we're gonna talk about uh, node importance as defined by how many people I'm connected to in, in based on some definition, some abstract definition that we've got. For example, they follow me or they retweet me or they tag me in their, ta in their tweets, okay? So what we're going to do is not talk about Twitter, thankfully, because we don't have to then deal with Kanye West. Uh, Mr. West is, uh, has his own life. Um, 
we'll do this data set, which is what we call the social patterns network. Let's take a look at what it is, right? This network describes uh, people walking into an exhibit, right? So they, f they come in some order, and they have a face-to-face -face connection with some other person in this exhibit for 20 seconds or longer, right? That's the definition of the graph. So the, the nodes are the people, and the edges are defined as I face you for more than 20 seconds. Um, multiple edges are possible. So I face you for 20 seconds, face someone else, come back, face you for 20 seconds, and then maybe we leave the room. Um, but for simplicity's sake, I've reduced this to just if you had an edge or not. All right? So I don't, I, I don't bother with modeling multiple, multiple connections between people. And that's just for simplicity's sake. So I'd like you to run this next cell down here. Um, and the cell below it, just so that we can verify that the graph is correct. Um, there should be 410 nodes and 2,765 edges. All right, everybody has that? Okay, great. So uh, one way that we, when we talk about uh, how many people I'm connected to in a graph, what we're saying is, who are my neighbors? Right, what we're really saying is, who are my neighbors? My neighbors in the graph are the people that I am connected to. So let's talk about the length of the list of, uh, so let's find out how, how we can interrogate how many neighbors an individual has. So let's say, for example, sorry, so, so to, to do that, you need to, every, every graph object G has a class method called dot neighbors. And there are two things that you can do with it. One. Oh, did I? Uh, sorry. Um, there's only one thing, my bad. You have, to, you have to pass in a particular node for which you're interested in, all right? So in this case, the nodes are integers. We're only keeping track of the integers as, as the nodes. And what we get is a dict key iterator. It's a generator of some sorts. This is part of the NetworkX API thing. We have to cast that as a list and now we get the exact identities of the neighbors of node number nine. So how many do they have? How many neighbors are there? Everybody gets 14? All right, okay, cool. So um, that's one way that we can do this. And let's think a little bit critically here. If we have an undirected graph, the notion of a neighbor is pretty simple, right? Uh, we share an edge. What about in a directed graph? How would you define a neighbor there? OK, that's very good. What's the first class? I am the sink, and the other is I am the source. Very good. So in Network X, um, for directed graphs, we have this notion of predecessor and successor, right? So if I uh, G dot predecessors of node nine will give me the edges that come into me. Uh, sorry, sorry, will give me the nodes for which I am the sink. Others are the, uh, is that right? No, G dot predecessors. Yeah, predecessors of nine. So that means people who come into me, right? And then the descendants of nine are the ones that are going out from me. All right, that makes sense. So, but if we do in an undirected graph, we can just do G dot neighbors. Okay, so. Um, this exercise is a three-minute exercise, which gives us a very natural way to go into the break. So I would like you to attempt exercise number three. Uh, this room should be noisy. I have a silly question. No questions are silly. Well, so it says, let's find out the number of neighbors for individual number seven. Yeah, and bug, and I did number nine. Okay. No problem, sorry. I just went on a, went on a tangent myself. And once you're done with this, feel free to go out to the restroom. Um, I'll actually know then very quickly how many people have finished this exercise. And um, if, it, if we hit 10.13, I will also give you a reminder, go get your, get your coffee and snacks. Beat the line.
Ah, uh, yes, I, I come from Canada. Right. So we use British English. But Network X was written in the United States. So it's neighbors, not neighbors. Okay, it's 10:13. Uh, get your coffee. Beat the line. Don't uh, don't wait too long. Let's come back at 10:20, yeah. 10:20, 10:20 or 10:25. I'll see what how many people are back by. Question.
Okie dokes. So how many people are done with this exercise that we left off with? Can I get a show of thumbs, please? All right, so we're at quorum. You should get something like uh, node 51 being the top ranked yeah. node. Everybody got that? Node 51 is the top ranked node? Great, all right. There are multiple ways of doing this. Uh, I had a very short debate with Myrtle just now uh, seeing, can we escape the fact that we need these lambda functions inside sorted? I'm not really sure. I don't think, I think the answer is no. Now, how many of you are not quite sure what's going on with this lambda thing? All right, for the benefit of you guys, I'm going to walk you through what's going on inside here. And if the rest of you see something wrong, feel free to raise your hand and correct me. So what we're doing is, we're doing, we're, we want to sort g.nodes, all right? but we don't want to sort it by their identity. We want to sort it by their, the number of neighbors that they have. That's the goal, right? Um, so sorted, if you just passed sorted of g.nodes inside there, it's going to sort them from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and all the way down. It's not going to accomplish what we want. And that's why we have the key keyword argument inside there. Key equals something. So now what we're doing here is we're writing an anonymous function. We're basically writing a function that says for every element inside there, get the length of the list of its neighbors. And then we'll sort by this key. That is how we're telling the sorted function to sort by the length of the list of the neighbors, all right? The other thing we want is we want it by default to go from smallest. So by default, sorted will go from smallest to largest. In this case, we want it to go from largest to smallest. Therefore, we have the reverse equals true put inside the sorted function, all right? People okay with that? Great. So then finally, if you look at the instructor notebook, you'll notice I always just select the first five. It's because I don't want the notebook to explode um, with a long list of stuff. And so therefore, we're just selecting the first five elements inside that list. So you're talking about exporting from a network X graph to a pandas data frame? OK, we'll get to that in notebook number five, right? OK, great. Good to know. Operator.itemgetter, OK. Anything else? Any other questions so far or pointers to raise? Great. All right, if there's no other pointers, we'll move on. Um, so neighbors. Neighbors was one way that we can rank the number of uh, rank each node by importance. We found uh, node 51 was the most important. The other way that we can rank nodes is directly related to the number of neighbors that they have. It's defined as the degree centrality of a node. So here's what the degree centrality definition is. Or actually, who knows what the degree centrality definition is? Or willing to hazard a guess except from Riddle. I saw his hand go up. OK, so here's what it is. The degree centrality of a node is defined as the number of nodes I am connected to divided by the total number of nodes I could possibly be connected to. Okay? The number of nodes that I'm connected to divided by the total number of nodes that I could possibly be connected to. So you can see immediately that there's a straight connection to the number of neighbors because the number of nodes that I'm connected to is the number of neighbors that I have. So the other way of putting it is the number of neighbors that I have divided by the number of possible neighbors I could have. So here's the next question. We know what the definition of the numerator is, the number of neighbors that we have. What about the definition of the denominator? How many neighbors could I possibly have if self loops are not allowed? I can be connected to n minus 1 possible neighbors. Now, if self loops are allowed, then it is and so if I have n nodes, then I have n possible neighbors. The definition is super important. If I remember correctly, um, nx.degreecentrality uses the definition of n minus 1. Self loops are not factored in. But the, the docs are the authoritative source, so go double check that if, if I'm incorrect to see if I'm correct about that. So what we can do is we can look at the degree centrality, Network X provides a method called nx.degree centrality. You pass in a, you pass in a dictionary, uh, you pass in the, the graph G, and what this returns, so let's, let's see what nx.degree centrality itself returns. 
What this returns is a dictionary. And it's a dictionary where the nodes are the keys and the degree centrality value is the value. All right? So then if we want to only pick out just the, the you know, first five in the list or something, um, then you know, we can, if we turn it into a list, rem remembering that uh, uh, dictionaries are not necessarily, not necessarily ordered, um, then we'll get back something like that. So we'll look at the first five in, in there. Um, so if you look carefully at the degree centrality of node 51, so let's do nx.degreeCentrality of node 51. That's, you should get something that's really high relative to the rest of the graphs, uh, relative to the rest of the nodes. OK, so now this brings into a, a concept, right? There's another statistical concept that comes up here, which is if you look at the degree centrality of every single node, you'll find that the, in this graph, there is a distribution of degree centralities, all right? Um, and so, one, this is a property of the graph globally that arises from the individual node connections, nodes and their connections. So the degree centrality distribution or the degree distribution is something that arises from the fact that we've got nodes connected to one another. And that's another reason why the heart of the graph is in the edges, not in the nodes. So what I would like you to try is to attempt the next few exercises in which we're going to visualize the distribution of degree centrality and the de distribution of number of neighbors um, and plot the number of, uh, plot degree centrality against the number of neighbors. Now, for this, for you guys, it seems pretty obvious to me that you already make this connection that th that scatter plot should be a straight line. So as long as you get the first, or the first two done, the ECDF, which is an, a way of visualizing the distribution of, uh, of, of stuff. As long as you get those two done, I'm fine. Before you go on, how many of you have heard of ECDFs before? OK, so this is a fairly obscure statistical topic, a uh, statistical term that I actually think should be much more popularized. Uh, how many of you know what a histogram is? So that's how you would think we should be visualizing the distribution of, um, of that's how you might think we should be visualizing the distribution of something, right? You use the histogram, you get some curve that looks like this with bins and stuff. But that last thing, the part about bins, is where the problem with histograms show up. You can have binning biases. You can have bins that are too big and obscure, obscure distributional. If your bins are too big, um, let's say you have, in the extreme case, you have a bimodal distribution, but you have a bin of one. You just have one, one thing. You've obscured the fact that you have a bimodal distribution, right? So if your bins are too big or if your bins are too small, you can introduce biases in the way that we interpret that thing. On the other hand, the ECDF is the empirical cumulative distribution function, or really it's the empirical cumulative distribution. The way that it's visualized is we have the, we rank order all of the values and we ask how many values occur, how many, uh, and we plot the fraction of values against the built that are smaller against the value itself. And we'll get some curve, right? And that curve is not affected by binning biases because we're plotting every single data point inside there. And so therefore we can do a very easy, unbiased visual check between two curves or two sets of ECDFs. So I, I want you to, to use this ECDF function that I've implemented. Feel free to take a look at the implementation. And once you've gotten to there, give me a thumbs up, and then we'll go through the interpretation of the ECDF once more, OK? This is a very important thing that I think we should all take away from this. This room should be noisy. Something like that. So let me just see what I have. I have something like that. So if you finish the first two exercises, that's good enough. Give me a thumbs up.
all good? Mine are working. Okay, great. Okay, we're at two minutes. How many people are done? Thumbs up. Okay, we'll, we'll give the full four minutes for everybody to finish. For those of you who are done, feel free to attempt exercise three and four. Or actually, actually exercise three. We've already done exercise four. For those of you who are doing exercise three, you get a straight y equals x, right? Yeah. Just a sanity check, that's all. Uh, yes, yeah, scatter plot of uh, degree centrality against number of neighbors. Okay, we're at the four minute mark. How many people have at least made it to number of neighbors? Thumbs up, please. Okay, great. So we're at quorum. We're going to move on from here. You should get something that looks like this. Uh, let me very quickly walk you through the ECDF interpretation, okay? So this is an important statistical concept. Uh, I learned this from a Caltech instructor, Justin Boyce, who I met at a SciPy conference. Uh, he's a big proponent of using this over the histogram for the exact reason that I was mentioning, the binning bias problem, all right? In addition to that, here's what you can take. There's a lot of nice information that's encoded on the ECDF. So for example, on the x-axis for number of neighbors, we have every node's number of neighbors values sorted, all right? So we start from very few neighbors to lots and tons of neighbors. Secondly, we then have the fraction of nodes that have fraction of values that are smaller than that particular value. All right, everybody okay with that? So immediately, there's some things that are quite visible from here. What's the median? Well, to get the median, we hit 0 0.5, draw a straight line over, and then drop down something like 12 or 13. You can sort of visualize that quickly. What's the 95th percentile? Same activity, go to 0.95, roughly go up there, and we come down there. So you can visualize percentiles, interquartile ranges, very quickly and informatively using the ECDF. It's not something that you can get uh, very easily from a histogram, right? And more importantly, we've plotted all the data. We've not done any kind of summarization or binning or whatever. So every single data point matters. Every single point is visualized, all right? This is the reason why I think ECDFs are much better. I've completely switched away from plotting histograms to plotting ECDFs because um, they give a lot of statistical information in a very simple plot, okay? If you want to look at the implementation of the ECDF, it's inside custom functions. Um, just take a look inside there, okay? Any questions about this? Absolutely, so it's, again, plotting the distribution of values, but in a way that visualizes all data points. Uh, what we do is we take every single value, we sort them, and we plot how many, we sort them, and what we're saying is what fraction of values are below my current value, all right? That's on the y-axis. So in other words, for this data point, basically 100% of values are below me. For this data point, basically 0% of data points are below me, all right? All cool? 
And that's how we get the median, which is by definition, 50% of my data points are below me. OK, all good with this one? This is a really cool concept. Go check out Justin Boyce's courses online at Caltech, uh, very, he, where he talks about statistical thinking. You'll get more exposure to that from there. Cool, and for those of you who got the chance to do exercise three, this is what you should get. It falls straight out from the definition of degree centrality and neighbors, all right? So you, if you didn't get something like, if you didn't get something like, is my screen? No, my screen is not curved. It's an artifact of the curving of the screen. Um, uh, if this curve, if this is not a curve, it's a straight line, you've done it right. Um, basically, yeah, that's just a sanity check there. Okay, so finally, um, I want to give you a feel for visualizing this graph using a package that I wrote, which is called NXViz. NXViz is something that uh, I built after seeing um, a lot of visualization packages scattered around that does this plot and that plot, and I was thinking, okay, wait, hold on. Um, we should be able to do this in a nice declarative way where we don't have to specify exactly what nodes take on which color, but rather just specify color by property. So this is how, this is how we, this is the package that I ended up building. Uh, Middle has been a contributor on some, some things. I've got people PRing new stuff into the package all the time. So uh, do check it out and consider it in your next project. Right? You don't have to use it, but do consider it. So um, this, is the, this is how you use uh, the, the NXViz. This is how you use NXViz. You basically instantiate a particular type of plot that you're interested in, the matrix plot, the circles plot, the arc plot, for example, pass in the graph, and then declare I would like my nodes ordered by some key. And then declare, I would like my nodes colored by some other key. And then under the hood, we have some heuristics that figure out the best coloring scheme, the right positioning of the nodes, et cetera. Okay? So uh, for example, if we were to visualize the social patterns graph, right, we would get something that looks like this. So this should be an exercise for you. But for now, I'm just going to show you the answer. Feel free to copy in and copy in the code and visualize it for yourself as well. This is what we get, right? So we have nodes ordered by the, t by their, by the uh, these are nodes that are ordered by the time that they came in, then, and that's, that's their, that's their um, index, right, in the graph. Um, and then we have edges that are drawn as like arcs between the nodes, right? So immediately, and, and so it starts from here. The earlier nodes are at the nine o'clock position. It goes, uh, it goes counterclockwise to back to the nine o'clock position. All right. So, having looked at this visual, what can you tell about the interactions that happened? Okay, that's right. So the order in which nodes, in, in which people come into this exhibit is a proxy for the time that they s entered into the exhibit. And so you'll notice there, most of the connections are very local, right? I go in, I have face-to-face -face contact, 20-second face-to-face contact with another person that also was inside the exhibit close, close to me, right? The temporal aspect is quite clear when we visualize the graph this way. However, there are some individuals, like, for example, this guy, which had face-to-face -face contact with a whole wide range of people, some over here, some who came in really late. In fact, one that came in really, 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 really late, right? Late into the game. So this is why it's, this is one example of why I think it's valuable to order the nodes in some particular fashion before, um, drawing the graph and, and, and so if you tried to you could never get this information from a hairball you could never get infer that the edges were mostly temporally local if you were to look at this the hairball version of this right so one way one thing that i think is pretty valuable from looking at the rational layouts is we can infer other things that might not be visually interpretable from from like the hairball view all right any questions about this so far okay all good all right so that's just a little bit of a thing that I hope you'll consider trying in your next network project. So let's move on to, uh, let's move on to this next thing called pathing, right? So finding paths in a network. Uh, finding paths in a network is important for the purposes of finding those important nodes. So let's go back to the Twitter example. Most people thought that people who were connected to a ton of other people are really important. 
right? And this makes sense for one definition of importance. Um, the other definition of importance could be I bridge communities, and if I weren't there, these two communities would be completely isolated from one another. In other words, information wouldn't be able to flow from one another. So we're talking about Republican and Democrats on Twitter, right, basically? They're, 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 they're their own echo chambers, but there are some people who bridge the two and are able to connect information from one place. So if they retweet something, they're probably retweeting from both places, and therefore information from the Republican side can move and flow to the Democrat side, even as much as the Democrats might not like seeing it, and vice versa, all right? So at least there's this information flow that's happening, which is important for a democracy, right? So um, when we talk about this, what we're essentially talking about is information flow through paths in a network, right? This is the important thing. And so what we're going to do next is the hardest part of this tutorial, which is we're going to figure out how we can find paths between nodes in a network and use that to figure out which, which uh, nodes are really important. Okay, so this is what we call the problem of graph traversal. How do we go from one place to another Sometimes, usually, there's some optimization problem in other contexts as well. What's the shortest path from one node to the, uh, to the next? What's the fastest way to fly from one city to the next, given the underlying connections for a passenger? So this is where this problem shows up. So let's talk about the shortest path algorithm. There are two ways to figure out whether, uh, first, to figure out whether two nodes are connected, and two, to figure out then, if they're connected, uh, what the shortest path is between them. So the way that we're going to introduce is called the breadth first search, in which we take a node, we take our destination node, and we iteratively look at shells around the, um, the, the source node to try to see how we can get to the destination node from this source node, right? So in, in a shell fashion, where we're going one degree out, two degrees out, then three degrees out, that's what we call the breadth first search. The alternative is the depth first search. We're not going to cover it, but it basically is I go as far along one, one train of thought first and then find, oh, okay, I can't reach, my, reach the destination. Then I go find another long train of thought and, until I actually reach the, uh, the destination node that I'm interested in. So here's what the breadth first search algorithm looks like. Okay, so... Uh, there are ways to do it in that is, you know, functional and recursive, but I think it's, it's much more instructive to think about it in a for loop kind of way before we attempt any f fancy uh, functional kind of programming. So we're going we're gonna to do the looping, uh, the loopy uh, breadth first search. Um, so what we do is, what we want to do is we want to start with our node, right? And then we want to move to the nodes that are in the first degree of separation away from us. So we have to build up this queue of nodes that we're trying to visit. Um, and then if our destination node isn't in this set of nodes, first shell, then we want to go two degrees of separation outwards, right? So we want to go to the second degree of separation and keep track of those nodes and keep appending them to the list of things that we want to visit. Does that make sense? And once we hit the destination node, we break out of this for loop and we say, we've kept track of uh, the path between these two nodes, and here's what it is. Are people okay with that? Yeah, sort of, sort of get that? Okay. So I this next exercise is basically implement breadth first search. Um, what we're going to do is we're not going to look for the shortest path. We're just going to ask, does the path exist between two nodes? This function takes in two nodes and the graph and returns a Boolean on whether the path exists between the two nodes or not. And it also prints out whether the path exists just for convenience purposes, okay? All right, go have fun. This is, a, this is the toughest problem you will face in this tutorial. I'm gonna give 15 minutes and if we don't, and, and about 40% quorum is good enough, this room should be noisy.
if you're getting stuck, be sure to talk with your neighbors, raise your hand. The uh, instructor notebooks are also available. Riddle and I can help as well. So one key that you might need, and some of you might have come to this realization, is you also have to keep track of the nodes that you've visited so you don't revisit them, right? Matplotlib? Yep, I built it on top of Matplotlib. Okay. But I want help to build it on top of Bokeh and Altair and all okay. the other all the other backends. So like if I usually when I'm like doing notebook stuff with Matplotlib, I start with like figure mm -hmm. and then like sig size equals eighteen and ten yep. something like that. And then I'll see could I like blow this up? Is, yeah, C basically like where I, where it defaults to like axis or uh, so C is a matplotlib object. So s if you do C dot ax, mm -hmm. that is the matplotlib axis okay. object. C dot ax. Yeah. Yeah, cool. it's right there. Good deal. So yeah, uh, everything is transparently exposed okay. in the NXviz. Awesome. <coughs> I'll have to look into this. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thanks a lot. We're at the five minute mark. How many people are done? Okay. Um, you guys are smart, really smart, because it took me and an MIT undergrad about half an hour to finish this. So keep in mind, not all MIT undergrads and grad students are smart, right? <laughs> And for those of you who are done, feel free to move on to the next few exercises. Don't have to wait for everybody. Okay, we're at the seven minute, 30 second mark. Do we have quorum? Let's see, how many people are done? Okay, so we are at quorum. I did say it's just 40% quorum is good enough for this exercise. I don't want to belabor this too much. If you didn't get it, 
then you are as smart as an MIT undergrad and grad student is. If you got it, you are fast smarter than an MIT undergrad and grad student is. All right, so kudos to everybody who did it. If you didn't get it, don't worry, don't worry. This thing, this thing took us a while to figure out, right? Like, especially for someone like myself back in the day when I was trying to figure this out, I knew nothing much about network science, and so that was, that was, a, it was a good, fun challenge. Question back there. Pardon me? Yes, that is. That is a bad thing to do. That, that, pardon me? That's right. It is not a right thing to do. It is not a good thing to do. You should not be changing the length of the thing you're iterating over, uh, especially if you're like deleting things from it. That's a bad thing. However, for the purpose of like figuring out this algorithm, I'm okay with this. Right? Now, if you wanted to do this properly, really you should probably figure out the uh, recursive version of this algorithm rather than the loopy version. But this sort of like gives us the way of thinking about think this gives us this exercise is designed to show us how to think on a graph and how a, how we might approach it not knowing the full structure of the graph, right? The whole thing about the breadth first search is a human can look at a graph and go, "Oh yeah, there, 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 there." But if you're a computer and you're looping over node by node and you're trying to figure out without knowing what the global structure is, which is exactly how a computer has to figure it out, then you have to be able to say, okay, this is what I want to do now, this is how I ex expand my search set, this is where I should go next, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that's the whole point of this exercise. I did have two more questions, one back there. No, it isn't. Uh, how to do uh, pathfinding at scale. Uh, I think it's a still, I think it's still a, an active uh, area of research. Middle, do you know anything better? Pardon me? Uh, what, what is it, sorry? Uh, is the fastest one? Okay, all right. So, yeah, it just isn't, isn't very scalable. I, I forgot what the complexity is. Um, we can go figure that out later. Any other questions? Okay, so let's, let's move on from there. Um, with the only thing I wanted you to make sure that you got was that in this very simplistic implementation, um, you have to keep track of your visited nodes. In an undirected graph, the neighbors of my neighbors include myself. So I don't want to revisit myself, right? Otherwise, I'll be in this ping pong situation where I just keep ping ponging between, between nodes. I only want to go outwards one, two, three degrees of separation. Um, and, I only want, and I never want to return to a node that I have visited before, okay? That's the first thing. Um, and then, yeah, that's the second thing. I do not want to revisit nodes, right? So that's, the, that's where the conditional is placed, okay? Great. Um, now, I, I made you spend seven and a half minutes of your life implementing an algorithm that already exists. Um, of course, we know it's for educational purposes. Uh, you can actually do the has path algorithm, uh, sorry, function call from network X, and it will tell you whether a path exists between two nodes or not, all right? So don't go around, unless, so the lesson is, unless you're trying to learn about the wheel, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, use whatever wheel people have built. Um, there are other shortest path algorithms that have been implemented in Network X. Go take a look at them. They're a lot of fun to use. So uh, we're going to do a few more exercises below that help us compose uh, Network X's built-in functions to help us solve higher order problems, right? So shortest path is one thing. Sometimes maybe we want to visualize the shortest path, or shortest path, shortest path is one thing, and we want to join this shortest path with another shortest path with another shortest path so we can like compose these things together. So if you do nx.shortestPath, for example, it'll give you, you know, the number of nodes, the, the exact identity of the nodes on the path from this node to that other node. Incidentally, it happens to be in, in exact order as well. Whoops, in, in exact order as well. Sorry. Um, so what we'll, what we'll do next is we'll do this exercise, which is, should be a short exercise, which basically lets us visualize, extract out the relevant nodes and edges from a graph and visualize just that portion of that graph. So it'll introduce you to some new you know, class methods and network X functions that you can try out. So let's try this exercise over here.
Also, feel free to talk with your neighbors. Okay, we're at the two minute 30 mark. How many people are done? Thumbs up, please. Okay, we'll give it maybe to the fourth minute and we'll move on. For those of you who are done, you should get uh, something that looks like this. The node layout may not be identical, but it basically is a chain, right? Question, yes. Yes, uh, so the, that's right. So the shortest path, there could be multiple shortest paths. Network X only gives one of them. And it's not, it's not guaranteed which, which one it, it will give. So basically, find the first one and just give that. Uh, it depends on the order of nodes in the in the dictionary. If you're all using the same dictionary, you should get the same answer back. How like that is the nodes were added in the same in the in the same order. They should be the same. Uh, there is an alternative, which is based on matrices, which is in bonus notebook number three, which we'll hopefully get to today. <coughs> Mm -hmm. But why do that? Why not do shortest path? Will it error out? Uh, that could work too. That's another possible answer, I think. Okay, so we're at the uh, four minute mark. Um, uh, we should, let's move on from here. Basically, we take advantage of the fact that we have a has path uh, function, right? And uh, it'll, and, and it'll, It'll give us a Boolean, which we can evaluate, and then use the shortest path. So we're basically, the whole idea here is we're trying to solve something higher order than just figuring out uh, what the shortest path is. We're trying to compose these things together so that we can solve bigger problems and make nice visuals while we're at it, all right? So there are a few challenge exercises that I'd like to invite you to try out at home. They involve some like message passing things, some propagation stuff. Um, go ahead, try them out. Um, I'm not going to belabor them too much over here, but I want to revisit, you know, come back, let's come back to this notion of degree centrality and this notion of bridges, right? So a bridge in that bridges two communities, what that thing has might be a small or a low degree centrality, but it will have what we call a very high betweenness centrality. So the definition of the betweenness centrality is that it is the number uh, I had, 
sorry, I, I'm blanking at the moment. It is related, I'm not gonna give the definition, I'm gonna give what it's related to. It is related to the number of shortest paths between pairs of nodes that pass through that particular node. So if a lot of shortest paths involve that node, then that node has a very high between us centrality. And if very few shortest paths involve that node, then that node has a very low between us centrality, all right? Okay, so if we plot, if you do the next exercise, uh, I'm gonna skip it here. I'm just gonna make the point because I think people are, are getting it intuitively. If you plot between the centrality on the y-axis against the degree centrality, you are not guaranteed to get a nice straight line or something that's highly correlated. In fact, you might get something that looks like this where you have some nodes that have a really high degree centrality but have a very low between this centrality, okay? So you'll notice then if you plot the ECDFs, the distributions are like wildly different. They are wildly different. And so let's think about a nice toy example then that really illustrates this bridge kind of concept. Can you think of a graph, you know, like not the Twitter graph, but what's the simplest kind of graph that you can imagine that involves nodes with high between the centralities, but low degree centralities. Oh, let's, let's, let's go a bit more abstract, but I think I, I get where you're going with that, yes. In a more general sense. What would be a... Things that you search for versus what you buy. Not sure that fits the definition, but we can talk about it later. Okay, so I'm gonna flash something up. This is what we call a barbell graph. It's the smallest uh, complex thing, simplest complex thing, that shows this concept of degree versus between the centrality, right? This node in the middle only has a degree of two. All the other nodes have like really high degrees, but it's between the centrality score is gonna be really high because in order for messages to go from one barbell end to the other end of the barbell, they all have to pass through this little guy in the middle. And of course, if you break this, if you take this node, the two barbell ends become separated communities. So this is a, this is a nice toy um, example that um, shows you the concept of, okay, we have this betweenness centrality thing, this high betweenness centrality, low degree centrality node. All right, any questions about this? So what I was, okay, so real world examples of actual bridges where if you remove that, that like cuts two communities, it's quite rare, right? However, you can have uh, a couple of things. Myrtle, do you, have a, do you have an example? Oh, okay, part two. Are you here for part two? No, okay, so, <laughs> okay. Ask Myrtle for that example, all right? Okay, so if you, well, so in that case, what we're doing is we're breaking an edge. Okay, so instead, if the bridge is the node, then what is the edge? Right. So. Okay, yes, okay, <laughs> all right. A person who presents at PyCon and RubyCon, for example, two languages that probably don't really speak to one another, that's the guy or girl or the lady who will be the one who passes information between these two communities, all right? Okay, great, so I think we all get that. Let's move on from notebook number three now to notebook number four. How many people at this point need a break? Okay, all right, so let's move on then, all right? Let's, let's power through. Um, Notebook four is what we're going, is, is on a slightly different topic. It's on not finding interesting nodes or finding paths in a graph, but rather finding interesting structures. So when we talk about structures, we, we commonly think about like um, communities, right? Uh, groupings of nodes that form some natural kind of community. But how do we define a community? Oh, there are many ways to do it. Depends on the problem. Even more simpler than that is this notion of a clique. We're gonna introduce the notion of a clique as well. Um, so let's, let's, let's start by um, introducing the data set. So if I could invite you to load the physician's network, run that cell. 
and then run the cell below so that we make a plot, a circos plot of this graph. So now when you look at this circos plot, what are your interpretations of this graph? Oh, I forgot, I forgot to mention actually what this graph is. This graph is a directed network, all right? Um, but I've modified it for simplicity, cast it as an undirected graph, all right? It's a physician trust network. So this is like old school America, 1966, uh, cities in Illinois, so we have um, uh, Peoria, Bloomington, Quincy, and Galesburg, right? And so the, a node represents a physician, and an edge between two physicians shows that the left doctor told that the right doctor is his friend, or that he or she turns to that doctor if they need advice or is interested in a discussion. So it's, it's a model of trust between doctors. There's always only one edge between two nodes, even if more than one of those conditions is true. And like I mentioned, I turned this from directed to undirected just for simplicity's sake. Okay, so now that you know this background, what do you think about this graph? What, what pops out to you? It looks like there's one for each city. Okay, anything else? Uh, so there's like one one really, one city that has a lot of doctors, potentially? Oh, they're more, like oh, they're more connected, okay, all right. Anything else? I think those are, those are basically the two, but anyone? Do we have three connected concerns? Or four connected, I'm not sure. Well, we're, we're gonna figure that out in this notebook. Yeah. Pardon me? <laughs> okay, all right, so they're like, they're, they're just isolated, okay, all right. Cool, so we'll, we'll investigate that in this notebook. So, pardon me? Yeah, it's four, okay, all right, cool. Um, let's talk about uh, this notion of what we would call cliques, all right? So if you think about the doctors, they're people, this is a trust network, what would you think would be the definition of a clique for these doctors? Or more generally, if you had friends in a social network, what, what would a clique look like? People attend one golf club, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, all right, so they all like golfing with one another. There, okay, there is a thing about a clique that makes a clique special though. So if we think about it in a social network setting, that's basically uh, I, I form an exclusive group of some kind, right? There's, a, there's this notion of exclusivity in the, in the definition of a clique. So um, for, for, for graphs, uh, the definition of a clique is uh, everybody, in that, everybody in that clique is connected to everybody else, all right? So then let's see what, follows, what falls out from this definition of a clique. What is the simplest clique? Not yourself, but, pardon me? So an edge, an edge between two nodes is the simplest clique. Then what is the simplest complex clique? A triangle, exactly, exactly. So, so let's. So the simplest complex clique is a triangle, and in fact, if you look at all clique finding, if you look at all higher order cliques, they can be decomposed into triangles, right? If you have a a, a triangle is what we would call a three clique, an edge is what we is what we would call a two clique. We would call a a square with the two crosses in with the x in between as a four clique but that four clique can be decomposed into three cliques, right? There, there are four triangles inside the four clique, right? And then there, and every four clique can be decomposed into edges in, an, in a trivial, obvious sense, right? Okay, so what we're going to do is, uh, what I've given you here is a, is a function that returns whether a node is inside a triangle relationship or not. So the triangle is the thing that I find the most interesting because it forms the basis of all other cliques. So how do we look at this? How do we find a triangle? How would you find triangle relationships? Having not seen that, I flashed that up a little too fast. How would you look at that? How would you find a triangle relationship? So you look over combinations of what? Okay. 
n c two of so you iterate over every pair of nodes. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Absolutely. Is there another way of doing it? Right, so this is the method that I've chosen, but obviously the, the, you, know, you iterate over triplets and see if all three are connected is another way of doing it. The way I've chosen is, is I iterate over every node and check to see if my neighbors are also neighbors of one another. Right? So if my neighbors are neighbors of each other, then we, the three of us are in a triangle relationship. So this is an example code that shows how that's done. There is a nice little function, uh, class method called g.hasEdge. It says, okay, is there an edge between these two nodes? And what's really cool is if I start with a given node and I just iterate over the pairs of neighbors, then I can figure out which sets are inside a, a triangle relationship. Now, again, I've skipped over this and intentionally not made this an exercise because Network X already has a function that returns the number of triangles that a given node is involved in. All right, and that for, therefore you can do a Boolean on that, right? If g.triangles returns zero, then it's false. It's not in a triangle relationship, and if it's not zero, it is true. It is in some triangle relationship. So let's try this exercise here, which then figures out uh, the set of nodes that are in a triangle relationship with itself, with, with a given node, right? So I, I pass in a graph, I pass in one node, and I want to know what are the nodes in this that are connected to this node that are in the triangle relationship with itself. I want to return both those other nodes plus the node that I'm interested in. Right? So give this exercise a shot. Talk with your neighbors. There are lots of edges in this room. Okay, we're at the two minute mark. How many people are done? Thumbs, please. Okay, we'll go to the five minute mark.
For those of you who are done, feel free to try the open triangles exercise, which is a few, a number of cells down below. Okay, uh, quick check. How many people are done with the get triangles exercise? Please give me your thumbs. Okay, we're roughly at quorum. So for those of you uh, who haven't completed, don't worry about it. The answers are available online. Uh, you can sort of try to work through the code. I'm just going to very quickly give you uh, the overview of it. So the, the goal of the function is to just redu uh, return this node set. So of course, we start with by initializing the node that we're interested in. Um, and then what we do is essentially what I had shown you earlier. Basically, if uh, we do the has edge thing, and then we uh, uh, add that to the set, all right? And then what this gives us is a node set that we can then draw out and verify that all of these nodes are in a triangle relationship with node number three in this example on the screen. And so some might be wondering, didn't we just get all of the neighbors? No. Because if we look below, you'll see those triangles are present. And at the same time, we have the other neighbors that are not inside a triangle relationship with node 3. All right? Everybody cool with this one? Any questions about this one over here? OK, so if there are no questions about this, uh, we're going to talk about the open triangles problem, right? So how many of you use LinkedIn? And how many of you have that friend recommender thing from that LinkedIn has, which is like, if you're connected, if I'm connected to A and I'm also connected to B, then A, uh, A and B will get a recommendation that says, oh, you two should probably also connect. It's on the basis of shared connections, right? So open triangles formed the basis of the friend recommender system. Uh, LinkedIn, I think, was the first. Facebook adopted it. Twitter started adopting it. And so then now suddenly we've got all these recommender systems that are based on this notion of closing open triangles, OK? So um, let's try this exercise over here, uh, which is basically a variation on the theme of uh, finding all the closed triangles. In this case, what we're looking for is the open triangles. So give that one a shot. So in other words, if my neighbors are not connected to one another, then we have an open, relation, open triangle relationship.
Okay, so how many people are done with this exercise? Give me your thumbs, please. Okay, we'll wait for a few more people to finish up this one. Note that the requirement of this function is slightly different. We don't want just the node set. We want every triplet to be enumerated, right? So uh, just keep that one in mind when you're doing this. Okay, a uh, quick sanity check. How many people are done with this question, this exercise? Okay, we're roughly at quorum. Um, let me just very quickly go through the key part to this answer. Um, the key line inside here is line number 13 in this cell that I'm showing up there, I've highlighted it. Basically, I iterate over every pair of that node's neighbors, and I ask if there is not an edge. If there is no edge between these two neighbors, then the three of us are in some open triangle relationship. Now, let's think critically over here about this definition of the open triangle. There are two ways we can actually find open triangles, and you've just seen one. One where the node is in the middle. What is the other way then? The node of interest is in the middle. What's the other way? It's at the termini. So how would you find that? What is the rough idea of the algorithm that you would use to find that kind of open triangle? Okay, so basically the intuition is there are three nodes. Imagine I have three nodes in flying in the air. I have a two-step connection there, but I don't have a connection there. All right, so what might you need to take advantage of that you've already learned in this tutorial to find that thing? You might need some, some kind of shortest path or some kind of two-degree path-finding algorithm, right? Um, the rough idea basically is if the neighbor if my neighbor's neighbor is not my neighbor, then we have an open triangle relationship. So let's just repeat that. My, my neighbor's neighbor, which is not myself, is also not connected to me, all right? So that's, that's the definition of, um, that's the definition of, that's the other way of finding the open triangles using sort of a path, path finding kind of thing. Okay, so not going to, belabor this too long. Basically, you, you, you all now have the basics of, uh, uh, you can write a recommendation system in your own, at work, right? Um, so the last part on cliques, I don't want to belabor it too much. So I'm going to intentionally make the exercises a little bit more lectury because you know, the exercise is just a, an exercise in filtering lists, so you don't have to worry so much about it. But I wanted you to know Basically, that network X provides a, a cliques function, a find cliques function, and it will find all maximal cliques that exist inside a graph, right? Of, and so what do we mean by a maximal, maximal clique? Um, well, between nodes one and two, there is a clique that exists, and it's just the edge, right? The smallest clique is the edge, so it will find every edge between every pair of nodes. 
that it will find every edge that exists, but it will also find the three cliques, right? And the four cliques that exist for that given node, right? So it will find all of these. And if you want to, you can go back and sanity check that all of these four cliques, five cliques, and six cliques can be decomposed back into their composite triangles, right? It's a result that you can sanity check on your own. You have the tools for this. Okay, so that's, that's just the thing that I wanted you to find, to do in the exercise, which I'll leave um, as homework style thing, is just to find the maximal cliques of a given size, right? So we wanna find all the three cliques, or all the four cliques, or all the K cliques, basically, all right? So that's, that's what the exercise is all about. So the final thing that's important is what you all had intuited at the beginning, which is this notion of, oh yeah, it looks like that physician trust graph has this uh, notion of uh, separate subgraphs inside there that are not connected to one another, right? So um, a connected component sub, so unlike a clique, which in this case is, it's, it's possible for this four clique to still be connected to other things, a connected component subgraph is one subgraph inside the larger graph that is not connected to any other subgraph in the graph. Does that sound very Inception-like? <laughs> no, okay, good. Um, so that's what the connected component subgraph is. You can literally think of it as my graph, G, has two subgraphs that are just completely isolated from one another. There is no connection between these two subgraphs. All right, so how do we find them? Well, Network X provides the connected component subgraph um, connected component subgraphs function. You pass in the graph and it'll return to you an iterator over all of the connected component subgraphs, which we can then convert into a list and get the length of, all right? So in this case, people saw it right. There are, you know, it looks like there are four connected component subgraphs inside there. And it sort of does make sense, right? It makes sense because this is uh, Old Town America, um, 1966, um, social media didn't exist. Uh, we had real social networking rather than like online social networking. And so people's trust networks were really confined geographically, right? You, you wouldn't have a physician who said, yeah, I really trust that doctor out over in that other town. This is also, you know, where we, we didn't have so many specialists um, in the medical profession. So, you know, like general physicians, GPs, they would be, they'd say, I, I trust that guy because I've lived with it, that guy. I've been in the same city of that, as that other physician for all my life, and I know that that person's a good, good doctor, right? Like, that's how people thought of trust networks back in the day. So the final exercise is an exercise in drawing this, drawing this with the circles plot. Uh, I'm going to leave this for, uh, for you to try to reproduce on your own, but if you get something like this, it's roughly correct. There should be four connected component subgraphs, therefore four colors on the nodes on the outside, and they're completely connect, uh, disconnect from, disconnected from one another, okay? And how we annotate each node is sort of shown over there in that, that part of the exercise, okay? All right, so a few people have asked about graph I.O., input, output, how do you get data in and out of Network X? That's exactly what we're going to talk about now. So I'd like you to open up notebook number five. So if you open up notebook number five, you will find one example, which I hope becomes your standard example, of how you can get graph data into Network X. However, if you look at graph data out there, they're not always pandas data frames. People don't get that. People in the network science world, I don't think, really get that pandas data frames are a great way of storing network data. They just store them in plain text files with some custom delimiter. If you're interested in how to parse those files, look at all the load functions in, in the custom functs uh, init.py. And you'll see all the tricks and all the trickery we've had to go through <laughs> to load a bunch of different network, network data sets, like string parsing, line parsing, the like. It's just crazy, all right? Network X does have some standard formats. 
Uh, but as we all know, if I have seven standard formats, someone will invent the eighth to call it the standard format, and then we'll have a proliferation of standard formats, which therefore is no standard format. Um, so unfortunately, that's the reality of network science data sets at the moment. So you might have to find the right Python trickery to customize your data loading code. Uh, my hope is you'll leave this notebook with a sense of, yeah, we can use pandas data frames. All right? So when we talked about um, the edge list and the node list, right, it seems like we can have tables of edges and tables, a table for edges and a table for nodes. In the node table, every row is a node, and every column is the attributes that we attach to each node. Likewise, in the edge list table, every row is an edge which, in which we know the start and the, the we know the, no, the two nodes that are connected. And then the other columns are the metadata that we want to attach, all right? So in this graph IO data set, we're gonna load something from CSV files. This is the Divi bike sharing data set. How many of you from Chicago? You, okay, great, so you know about Divi, right? Yeah, it's the bike sharing thing. We have in, in Boston, we have the uh, hub bikes. San Francisco has its own thing. I'm really envious of the San Franciscans having um, electric hub, electric um, bike share. That's a really amazing thing. Um, so uh, run this cell. Uh, it will automatically unzip the directory, the data for you, and give you a CSV file. All right, this will give you a CSV file, which we can then start to use. All right, so everybody's gotten that done. So here's, here's the code pattern. Really, most of this notebook, uh, I'll, I'll be talking. Um, this is the code pattern that you might want to consider. And this is the code pattern that, you would, that is more general than what is provided inside NetworkX, which is, uh, NetworkX does have its own like from pandas data frame thing, and it has its own to pandas data frame thing. Um, if for some reason it doesn't work for your solution, this is the code pattern that you probably want to, probably want to consider, okay? So, under the hood, what we have to do is we have to first read the CSV file as a pandas data frame. It becomes quite clear. We can model the nodes with the ID column and then add the name, lat, long, capacity, landmark, and online date as metadata to the, to the graph. All right, so if we look at the trips, trips likewise, we have a trip ID, start time, stop time, and here's the most important part. We look at the columns, uh, this is a data set of all of the bike trips, so that we have the from and the to, all right? The from and the to. And this, is, this, this gives us the, the edge definition between uh, the, the bike stations. Let's talk about the graph model that we'll want for this. Uh, let's say the question we were trying to answer is um, the number of bike trips that occur between pairs of stations. Would we use a multi-graph, multi-directed graph, or uh, just a plain vanilla directed graph? Think about that. Talk with your neighbor. What do you think? So the definition of a multi-graph is we're allowing multiple edges between nodes. The definition of a digraph, directed graph, is there's only, one, there's only one edge of a particular direction between those two nodes. However, we can have weight parameters on, that as, on those edges as well. So what would you use? Any takers? Any, any ideas here? So you want a weighted directed graph um, and your choice, your reasons for that choice? Right. 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 And the more crucial thing is we're not interested in the details of any individual bike trip. Right, right. exactly, exactly. So. We're just counting, keeping track of like how many trips went between. So the more compact data structure 
is to do the directed graph, and on the edge between the two nodes, you keep track of how many bike trips were uh, inside, were, that occurred between those two. Okay. On the other hand, if we were still interested in the individual bike trips, that's when we would want the multi-directed graph, right? So ag th again, the choice here of data model depends on the problem we're trying to solve, right? Uh, as a general rule of thumb, if you looked at this data set and you tried to keep track of every single edge, good luck on your single MacBook, right? Like, it's, it's just gonna be way too much. So for, for, for this notebook, I'm just going to show you how we construct from the Pandas data frame, the summarized graph, which keeps track of how many bike trips without retaining any detail of the individual bike trips, okay? So scroll down a little bit. The way that it happens is we do this. First, we instantiate the graph, okay? G equals nx.digraph. Then we iterate over the stations data frame. We instantiate the nodes first, all right? So um, one thing that we do is, for example, we might want to say um, the two dict equals, uh, the two dict records thing allows us to uh, convert this into a dictionary, a list of dictionaries, convert the data frame into a list of dictionaries, and we can then grab the node ID and set that as the node. And then we have the attribute dictionary which we pass in which is the rest of the dictionary, okay? If we, so like I was mentioning, if you wanted to sort of do the, do this thing, where you iterate over all of the, all of the rows in the trips data frame, that would be a horrible thing to do on a single node. Good luck. <laughs> it's a long time to finish that. On the other hand, if what we do, uh, let me, let me split this out into a couple of, uh, oh no, 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 no. Let me split that out into a couple of lines so that that chunk of code is explicit. We do a trips dot group by dot count dot reset index. Okay, so what we're saying is group group my data frame by my start and uh, from and to station IDs. That will give us chunks of data frames that are like really of different sizes then just get the counts from the trip ID from one of the particular columns. Any of the columns will work, right? And that gives us the, 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 re, uh, what is it? It'll give us the, um, it'll return a data frame. Yeah, I should, just to convince ourselves of that, right? It'll say from station ID to station ID, how many, how many trips have occurred between them, all right? So that's what, that's what counts is. And then, finally, we iterate over that, and this finishes really quickly, all right? So uh, I'm going to, in the interest of time, there's really more interesting stuff that I want to show you. So this is just one example of how you do graph input-output from, uh, uh, from Pandas data frames or you know, CSV files. If you can get your network data as CSV files, all the better, because NetworkX has a from pandas data frame and to pandas data frame function. Go find it in the docs. It's a very good thing to use. Only do this custom stuff if that doesn't fit your use case. All right? Any questions about this? Not at all. All right, and if you want more fun looking at all the weird trickery you need to go through to load custom data, custom funks, uh, slash load datasets.py has everything, all right? Okay, let's see if there's anything else that's interest that we need here. Okay, so one other thing you might want to consider is if you scroll past some of that stuff in the notebook, there is also a binary serialization format for, so we just use pickles, Python pickles, to serialize the graph object onto disk. I've done this where I've like, uh, where the computation, so for example, I've done this in cases where the graph construction is an expensive computation. I want to cache the graph object as is on disk so that I can load it later on as it is, as it exactly was when I first constructed the graph. So I'll, I'll spend my time creating the graph from uh, whatever file that I, I had before, and then I'll say nx.writegpickle Right? And it'll write the graph G to this path, the, the file handle. Right? And under the hood, it'll do that. And then uh, you can load back 
the graph data by using g equals nx dot read, read g pickle and passing in the path that you need. All right? Okay. So this is another this is another option. Now do note, uh, pickle objects never accept pickle objects from an untrusted source. Right? Um, security is a big big thing that we all have to worry about. So only accept the only do the write and read only do the read g pickle if you trust that that your source of your pickled pickled graph. All right, any questions here? All good? Okay, great. And the stuff down below was just to show you, convince you that the objects are identical. Okay, here's where we get to go to interesting stuff. So, um, notebook six is on this thing called bipartite graphs. Um, bipartite graphs are really interesting. Bipartite graphs, uh, how many of you have heard of a bipartite graph? Okay, what would you use to model using bipartite graphs? Okay, so what are the nodes here? The nodes are teachers and disciplines, and edges indicate this teacher was is teaching this discipline. Okay, anything else? How many of you have seen those weird Amazon recommendations where if you buy a laptop, they recommend five more laptops? <laughs> Underneath the hood, there is a bipartite graph there. So what is that bipartite graph? What are the nodes? Customers and products, and the edges are customer bought a product. Okay, so herein lies the important definition of a bipartite graph. You never have an edge between nodes of the same partition. It makes no sense for a product to purchase a product. Likewise, I hope we're out of the era where customers buy customers. All right. <laughs> We should be out of this era. This was the uh, past time gone past. Um, we're out of the. We're out of that period. People don't buy people. People buy products. All right. People treat people as people. They don't treat people as products. So, um, that's the definition of a bipartite graph. Uh, I have two node sets rather than a single node set. I have two node sets that are connected to one another through edges that only connect nodes on different partitions. Okay. So visually, if you look at Wikipedia, basically you get something that looks like that. Okay, so um, we have over here a data set that is the crime bipartite, crime data bipartite uh, graph. And the whole point of this notebook is to show you how you can model bipartite data in a way uh, using Network X. So in here, we have crimes and we have people. These are the node sets. And then there are relationships in which, which are defined as, say, for example, one individual was a suspect in a crime, another was a witness in that crime, right? And so we can find for a given crime which individuals are connected to, which individuals are involved by looking at the edge relationships there, all right? So let's run that first cell. You can see um, we have person one with crime one and the role is a suspect, person one with crime two, Wow, this, this dude is like, this person is like really, really sad. <laughs> like involved in four crimes as suspects and victims, right? Um, I hope none of us have to face that. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so th this is the basic, this is the relationships. These are the relationships that are defined on this graph. Now, um, what's really important is how NetworkX stores this bipartite information. They're using, what we use in Network X is we use the bipartite attribute. So it's, it's not a fancy graph. You don't add like another, uh, you know, nx.bipartite graph. You don't have that. We, we just use, take advantage of the Network X graph or digraph objects and assign the nodes to a different partition by using the bipartite keyword. All right, people okay with that? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, now one thing that's really cool about bipartite graphs is that we can compute which individuals are related to one another conditioned on the other, on their involvement in crimes. Uh, that sounds kind of bad. Um, or, or maybe in a more positive sense, which customers are similar to one another conditioned on their purchase history, all right? 
And the way we do that is by computing the projection of a graph, of a bipartite graph, onto one of the node sets. Right? So we compute the projection of the bipartite graph, say the save customer products, um, onto, the, onto the customer node set. And in that, we'll get a, no, a lot of nice properties, such as the, the, the connectivity, the strength of connectivity between customers, the number of shared purchases that they have. It, it, it falls out pretty nicely. So Network X uh, provides a bipartite projection function. So I'd like you to attempt this exercise uh, without looking at the answer on the screen. Find out, uh, try to use that bipartite projection projected graph function to compute the projection onto the people nodes for this uh, bipartite graph. Right? Now, in the interest of time, I will have the answer flashed up on the screen anyways, um, because there's some really cool things in one of the bonus notebooks I really want to get to, to share with you. So in order to compute the bipartite projection onto one of the node sets, you first have to collect the nodes from that first node set. And then you pass that in to the network X uh, projected graph function. So this is the way that we use it. So quick sanity check, how many people are done with this one? Thumbs, okay, so you might, uh, are, are people stuck at the projected graph or are you stuck at the uh, node set? Node set or projected graph? Uh, how many are, how many of you have already computed the node set? Okay, so then I think that's where this might, so you'll have to come back to, the list comprehension thing, right? Uh, filtering out nodes, constructing a node from, constructing a new list of nodes from the node set. So it's, it's noon, I'm going to walk you through the answer. Don't worry if you didn't get it. Uh, this, there, this, this time period is a little bit compressed on, on purpose. Um, so what we need to do here is first collect the node set of person nodes, right? We only want, if we want the projection of the crime person graph onto the person node set, we need to first get the person nodes out. The way we do is we get the nodes from the node list 
but only if their bipartite partition, their keyword bipartite, is person, right? So if you looked at the data structure back up here, right, we have the bipartite is person or bipartite is crime, all right? People okay with that? You can also take advantage, there's an alternative way, you can take advantage of the, the fact that the, the nodes start with P or C, right? So you can check the P or C um, for uh, whether they are the person or the, or, or the crime nodes, okay? People okay with that? Then after that, we'll get the projection, the projected graph of G, passing in only the person nodes. And the, what this will give is the person person graph s colored, by s colored by their gender, right? Um, and we can visualize then that there are some people who are highly involved with other people in lots of crimes um, in whatever capacity, um, and there are some people who are just poorly connected. And on general, it looks like, I forgot what, which one is male and female, I think there are more men involved in crimes in general. So it looks like there's uh, a lot of men are involved, firstly, and secondly, uh, there are quite a number of people who, who aren't so involved. And you might notice that there's this nice partitioning um, of, the, of, the, of the edges, right? Like we have a, a, a nice distinct grouping based on how many crimes they're, base, they're involved in, right? Um, I think I'm just trying to be explicit about where this is coming from. Does dot projected graph work? Okay, yeah, that's probably network X is like bipartite from by in the imports. It's like from two modules down import that thing. So that that's totally okay. All right, so we can do the crime links and visualize how crimes are related to one another. There's this isolated set that is not related to anything else, right? We can we can find that from looking at the projection. So these are like singleton things, but the crime graph might be really useful for police to figure out, okay, there's this cluster of crimes that are highly related to one another based on the fact that they've got similar people involved in them, right? So then that can help aid with triaging cases to, to tackle, all right? Yep, yep, that's exactly the intuition. So you, when you need to preserve information about the papers themselves, uh, you do have flexibility. And I think the, the nice thing about bipartite graphs, let me think. So the nice thing about bipartite graphs is it's a more explicit data model, firstly, right? We're explicitly considering papers as nodes. And then therefore, uh, rather than in the author-author in the graph, it's really about shared authorship. Right? So there's a little subtlety there that if we're a bit more explicit, that's one example where I would prefer the bipartite graph. Pragmatically speaking, um, if we go to the next notebook, you'll, you'll notice there's ways to compute these projections in very efficient ways um, that therefore help with the analysis. So sometimes, so uh, when I start out, and I, I'll usually start with the most granular thing possible. The most granular thing in this case is the bipartite graph, because it's, it's the most explicit about what the relationships are. I wrote this paper, I wrote this paper, that guy wrote that paper, that paper was written by these five people, right? It's the most explicit. And then from there, we can compute this more summarized graphs, right? The, the projections, you can think of them as like summary graphs of the bipart bipartite graph, right? Sort of make sense there? Yeah. Also, some of the things that you can get from the bipartite graph include, like, uh, if, I, if I take one author or one person and look at how many edges they have on the, to the other partition, that's an immediate, the, the degree on the bipartite graph is an immediate reflection of the number of connections to the other thing on the other node set. So it's also like, you have these nice graph theoretic things, though I'll, I will preface, you can also get that information just by looking at the edge list table. You don't have to necessarily use the bipartite graph. Um, so do whatever is, makes most pragmatic sense is 
generally the, the thing that I would say. Anything else? Mm. Yes, exactly. Product recommendation. Exactly. Yeah, so that's another place. That's another place where being more explicit really helps. Okay, cool. Thanks for that point. I, I was blanking on that one there. So now we go to some interesting things uh, with matrices. All right, so how many of you, how, for how many people was linear algebra like more than 10 years ago? Myself included. So this was the most fun notebook to write for me in, most, in the most recent iterations, and I'm hoping you'll find it really fun and interesting too. Um, it turns out, if you look at graphs, and uh, if you look at graphs, there's a lot of linear algebra relationships that are really interesting. Um, if you remember, we have the adjacency matrix form of the graph, right? So the adjacency matrix is node by node um, for so for bipartite graphs, so for regular graphs that don't have partitions, it's going to be a square matrix, right? For bipartite graphs, is this going to be a square matrix? That's right. It is not guaranteed to be a square matrix. It will be a square matrix if we have partition one nodes equal to the number of partition two nodes. Right? We can never have a, par a node between, an edge between nodes of the same partition, so the natural matrix representation is put one partition's nodes as rows, put the other partition's nodes as columns. Right, so we're gonna look at both of these cases. It's really cool. The first thing that I wanna show you, so, so if you could open up bonus three matrices, right, the student version, um, we're gonna look at some of the simple examples and then do some more complicated examples. So in this toy example, we have a linear chain of nodes. It's just a simple zero, one, two, three. It's undirected or directed, depending. So in this case, uh, G1 is a toy linear chain in an undirected graph, and we visualize it. It looks like what you see on the screen, right? It's just a chain of things. There's no arrows indicating directionality. What does this look like in matrix form? It's a square matrix. It's symmetrical about, uh, about the diagonal, right? Everybody got cool with that, right? So in this case, node one is connected to node two. Node two is connected to node one and node three. Node three is connected to node two and node four. Node four is connected to node three, right? That makes sense? Now, if we take the matrix form, if we want to get the matrix form of the graph, network X provides a two numpy array function that will give you back the adjacency matrix, right? And if I want to provide a particular ordering of nodes, I can pr provide in the node list equals whatever. Or if I want to do a subgraph of it, I can just provide in a subgraph of the nodes, a subset of the nodes, right? Everybody okay with that? So one thing that's really cool is if you take the matrix power of a graph, this is what you get. You, have, you, you get a matrix that looks like this. Take a look at the diagonals. If we look at the diagonals, it, for matrix power two, that means we take the adjacency matrix and matrix matrix multiply against itself, it turns out that that is the degree of each of those nodes, right? So node one only has one edge. Node two has two edges. Node three has two edges. And node four has one edge. Right? So that's a, that's a neat result. That's the diagonal of the resultant matrix multiplied uh, thing. S this is assuming undirected graphs, right? Now, that just turns out to be a coincidental result. Really what we're saying is that there is, so matrix power two corresponds to the number of paths between nodes of uh, uh, corresponds to the number of, number of paths that, we, that exist between nodes uh, in the matrix. So if we think about that linear chain, how many paths does it take of path two to get to itself? I go to my neighbor and I come back. For that second node, zero, one, two, three, for, for node number one, there are two ways. I go out each way and then I come back, right? If you look at the off diagonals, 
that's how many paths exist from that node to that other node of that particular length k. All right? So if we take the third matrix power, you'll notice the diagonals automatically become zero because there's no way to go from myself to my neighbor and back in three steps. By definition, I have to be somewhere else. Right? That's a really neat result. So in the case of this chain graph, we, we, we can, to get to, to, get to uh, my neighboring node in three steps, there are two ways to go about it, which is why then the off diagonals are two, or one, or three, or whatever number, right? It's because, let's say to go from z node zero to node one, I need to go to there, back, sorry, from node one back to their neighbors, I can go one, two, three, or I can go one, two, three, right? Do you see what I mean? So for, to go from node one to node two, there, there are at least, there are two ways to do it. One, two, three, one, two, three. Right? So there, th it, it's a really neat result. It, basically, the matrix power counts the number of possible paths um, of length k between any pair of nodes. And that's why with matrix power 2, you have this neat result where the diagonal is just the degree. OK? So in, another, in the, in the non-directed case, where we have just 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, uh, sorry, in the directed case, my bad. In the directed case where we have to go, f we, we only go from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, um, the matrix is going to be asymmetrical, right? So uh, you'll notice there's the diagonals, the off diagonals shift by 1 on this side, but there's no off diagonal on the other side because there's no path back from a second node back to the first node, first node back to the zeroth node, right? So if we do the linear linear matrix power, you'll notice that the number of paths of length two between any pair of nodes, there's, there's only p two paths of length two in this four node chain. There's zero to two and one to three. So then if you do the third matrix power, it's, there's only one. You should only expect zero, one, two, three. There's no other way back. Are people okay with this? Are we okay with this? Okay, good, good. Um, all right, sorry, I just did the exercise for everybody. <laughs> all right, so what we're going to do is very quickly look at this real data, this real data set called, uh, this is a university social network, so it's a dorm room kind of a thing. Um, and if you make the matrix plot, it looks something like that. So I'd like everybody to just fill in your cell in the notebook with uh, nx nv.matrixplotg, so make sure you execute the cells at the top, Copy this, copy this line of code inside there and convince yourself that you've got a matrix. Okay? Nv.matrixplotg.draw will I'll just draw the matrix to the screen. Nv.matrixplotg.draw. Everybody okay with that? Great. So, first off, uh, Let's find out how many connected component subgraphs exist inside here. It's not obvious from this whether this is a fully connected network with, between all the nodes or if we have connected component subgraphs. So please use what you know from the previous notebooks to find the number of connected component subgraphs inside this graph. And do the thing where you con convert it to an undirected graph first by doing g.2 undirected. All right, you should have this line. If you couldn't figure out, don't worry. Copy what's on the screen. Let me zoom in a little bit so that you can, so the font's a little bit better. People at the back can see that. Or if you have the instructor version of the notebook open, you can also just copy, copy the code over. And so we know that this graph is fully connected. Like there's, they're not fully connected. There's, this graph doesn't have component subgraphs. There are no 
Thankfully, in this dorm, there are no people who are, there are no individuals who are isolated from one another, right? Um, that forms a, in the u pressure cooker environment of the university, that forms a bad thing. So next, uh, let's find the connected component subgraphs inside. So now that we know that there's only one connected component subgraph inside there, we can do the shortest path thing very nicely. All right, so uh, we'll pick two nodes at random. You do nx.shortestPathG, and then you pass in, say, node 30 and thir node 100. You'll notice that there's a path, there's a shortest path of length four between these nodes. All right, so here's the very interesting thing. We can, so someone asked just now, does shortest path return all of the, does the shortest path algorithm return all of the shortest paths? The answer is no. Yeah, the answer is no. However, now that we know the length of the shortest path between those two nodes, if we took the matrix power of the adjacency matrix, so fourth matrix power, and then indexed into the matrix, uh, we the appropriate node, node pair, we can get back how many shortest paths exist between those two nodes, all right? So if you do that, so np.linalg.matrix power of A, we raise it to the power of four because we want to find all paths of four between all pairs of nodes, but then we only index into node 30, which is index 29, and node 100, which is index 99. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Everybody, that makes sense? All right, so we actually find out that there are 40 possible shortest paths between node 30 and node 100. It's a very cool result. It is a very cool result, okay? Oh, let's see, we are at, we're two minutes in. So I am going to give the two minute short lecture version of whatever is left. And you can, uh, if you have questions, about this, we can talk about it over lunch or after Middle's section, if you're here for part two, we can also continue to talk about this. There's a wonderful, amazing stuff you can do. You can do this thing called message passing on a graph. So if we're talking about a dorm and we have a directed graph, which, which indicates who talks with who, right? Um, if a rumor starts with one individual, it will propagate. It'll propagate across the graph until a lot of people know about this thing, about this rumor. So um, there's a matrix interpretation of the message passing thing. And the way that it works is we start with a matrix. We start with the adjacency matrix. We need that. But we also need to have the vector of uh, node states, where the message is, right? So if it starts at one node, let's say the first node in the graph, node zero, then we, in this vector, the first element is a one and the rest is zero. The rest are zeros. Everybody okay with this? Then we take the matrix multiply of the vector, matrix vector multiply, and we'll get back another vector, which indicates where the message is conditioned on the adjacency matrix. How, where has it spread to, okay? So the way that it works is if you look at the code, right, in this chain graph, this directed chain graph, this toy example, it starts at node one and it is nowhere else. The message is nowhere else. If we matrix multiply it against the adjacency matrix of the directed graph, now that message has moved on to that second node. And if we continue doing it message two against message three, now it's moved on to the third node and so on and so on, right? So if you look at the rest of the exercises, you'll get this really neat animation. You'll make this really neat animation where the message is being passed from node to node as such. So let's visualize that. You can see the, see the colors happening. And if you do it for the rumor network, you'll see propagation of the information from node to node as well. And it all stems from doing this basic matrix matrix multiply. The final part is on bipartite graphs. As it turns out, if you take the adjacency matrix of the bipartite graph and matrix multiply against its transpose, you get the projection. 
it's a super cool result. Um, I'm going to leave it at that, except to say that you may want to, the important part of why I've introduced matrices is because some of these operations that you might want to try, if you were to use the pure Python network X thing, they would take up to 100 times slower if you were to do it with the network X functions as opposed to doing it with matrix. So that's the point, the last point down here in which, you know, this is re really nice and readable. I compute the projection and then uh, compute the projection and find the most similar nodes on one projection. It's readable. It takes 26 seconds on this graph that is about 20,000 nodes. However, if I do the matrix operations, I get the exact same result, but in 0 0.8 seconds, all right? So this hopefully gives you the point. Of course, we sacrifice, what we sacrifice is the readability of the code, okay? So there's always this trade-off somewhere. Okay, all right. Um, with that, we've come to the end of part one. Thank you everybody who has persisted for the past three hours and 20 minutes with tough coding problems and hearing me lecture on stuff. Um, for those of you who are staying for part two, uh, we'll be back in the same room. I would like you to, uh, so I will send out an email based on the class, uh, from the class page of the survey monkey, monkey link where we'd like to collect feedback from you on how well we did with this part of the tutorial. I think the two part tutorials have separate survey monkey li links, right? So please do it for this one. And if you're doing it for the second part, please do it for the second part separately. Okay, everybody all right with that? Great, lunch is out at the grassy area off East Mall Drive. They're food trucks apparently. So have fun. Please take your belongings because I don't think anybody will be in this room. Um, if you want your seat where you were for the first, first part, come back early and, and take it, all right? Thank you very much.